What is up, Fence fam? Welcome back. So good to see you. It's been a couple weeks. Actually, it's been several weeks, I think, since we had our last live Q&A, and it has been an action-packed couple of weeks. Uh, we've been everywhere from New Orleans at Fence Tech, where I saw a lot of you guys, and man, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see the, put names with faces, right? Or faces with names. That's the way. So guys, I see in here commenting a lot and commenting on the recorded videos I got to meet in person. Always a great time. I think everyone that went would agree that Fence Tech was, it was a heck of a good time. It really was. Down in New Orleans, uh, the city itself, great time. It was the week leading up to Mardi Gras, so always a bit of a festive environment down there, I think, right around this time of year. Uh, back for, see, we went out there Tuesday, came back Friday. We filmed a massive amount of content at Fence Tech. I hope you guys are really going to enjoy it. I think you are. I enjoyed making it. Uh, so the first, actually, the first video went up last week, and it was just kind of a sneak peek into Finstech, right? It was basically uh, a video of what, uh, fast fast motion video of kind of what was going on at Finstech. So Jeremy followed me around as Sarah and I went and talked to some vendors that uh, we hadn't seen in a while and then uh, put it into kind of like a mashup, really. And then today's video is going to be what's new in 22, where we actually uh, stopped and talked with several of the vendors about what they've got coming up, vendors that we enjoy working with, and we thought that you might enjoy knowing as well. Um, then we, what all did we do? We filmed a ton of fence stories. So uh, what I want to start doing, one of the things I want to start doing with the channel is documenting guys' fence stories. And what I mean is, like, how did they get into the industry what have they learned? What would they do differently? That sort of thing. Uh, I am super excited about this project. It's going to be, it. it's a massive project. It's going to take quite a while uh, to actually, you know, to get all of these guys and gals sat down and uh, just figure out why they came into the industry and what they would do differently, that sort of thing. What advice they would give to future fencing professionals. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for it. So we recorded, I want to say, I want to say six or seven interviews. We went one night, we went uh, to about midnight, 1 a.m. Just we had a we had a condo full of fence professionals and uh, just started filming stories. So I'm excited to bring that to you guys. We also have some normally recorded content for you as well. We've got, I think, two months worth of content right now saved up, ready to go, loaded and ready for you guys. So anyway, uh, New Orleans was a hit. I, like I said, I think those of you that, would, that had attended would agree uh, it was a pretty good time. We were back. Let's see. We flew back Friday night pretty late. Saturday morning, Jeremy, uh, the producer, and I got up. And we're in this uh, group here in Springfield called Springfield Sertoma. We're an area. We're a charitable organization that we put on fundraising events for area children's charities, you know, such as Big Brothers, Big Sisters, uh, Boys and Girls Club, that sort of thing. Um you, there's some there's some others but those are the two names that you would rec you would recognize there's also like diaper bank of the ozarks is one we enjoy working with anyway we put on a massive event saturday uh called sertoma chili cook-off where something like six to eight thousand people showed up uh we served chili we had bands uh served a few drinks uh overall raised almost a hundred thousand dollars for these organizations so that was an action-packed day uh sunday and monday <laughs> recuperated and rested and then we were off to Nashville for Staining University, uh, where we had three days this year. So I have been fortunate enough to watch Staining University grow from a one-day to a two-day, now to a three-day training event. Um, I saw a lot of you guys back there as well. So I saw, uh, we'll get to the comments here in just a second, but I saw Dan Wheeler in the comments. Uh, I saw, met Dan for the first time in person at Finstech, and then uh, again at Staining University, so we saw some some, some familiar faces in back to back weeks. It's a pretty good week for fencing. It really was, or to, for meeting fence professionals. Uh, it's my people and staining professionals. I don't. I view staining guys as fence guys. I, I think we're all one big extended family. Um, but we had three days. We also met some power washing professionals. So the third day uh, was geared more towards power washing uh, because expert stain and seal is, you know is wanting to laser focus in on, you know, uh, professional wood care, wood preservation, that sort of thing. So power washing made sense to incorporate into that because these are a lot of the same professionals uh, that are cleaning fences that also clean most of your exterior surfaces. It was an incredible event. 
Uh, so after three days of that, that takes us to Sunday. This past Sunday, flew back into town and had a full week of just getting uh, reacquainted with the office here. Uh, what was going on? I mean, it's got my my ability to travel for this channel is a testament to the team. So uh, if you're on the Ozark Fence team and you're watching this, thank you. Uh, you guys, you guys, you know, make this all make this whole thing possible. Now let me address the elephant in the room. Where is my Joe Everest, the fence expert shirt? Well, one, there's several. That's a question I get a lot. Like, do you just wear the same shirt over and over? Well, there's actually like eight shirts uh, right now that are all exactly the same. And they are all right now sitting at the dry cleaner. And when I got back, actually, so midweek, I was supposed to take them right when I got back. But midweek, I took them into the dry cleaners. Forgot to pick them up yesterday. And I thought, oh, I'll just pick them up on the way in. Not remembering that the dry cleaners doesn't open until 9 a.m. So. Rookie move, I know, but we're stuck with the Ozark Fence polo, and I say stuck with it. Ozark Fence, you could say, is one of the um, one of the main sponsors of the channel. They make this thing happen because we don't receive monetization from YouTube uh, at the moment for this channel. So anyway, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into the comments. Let's say hello to some of the Fence fam because I haven't seen you guys in the comments in several weeks. Hello from Ireland. Hello, Ireland. Welcome. Appreciate you joining the channel. They are a, a DNJ. So if you guys watch the channel, you know DNJ Projects is where it's at. I enjoy watching those con content a lot. Uh, so uh, a few weeks ago, at well, let's back up. So probably a month or so ago, uh, they had done a video where Stevie had mentioned that they were looking for a new tripod. They were looking for suggestions, and I thought, you know, I know exactly what tripod they need. I sent them. Uh, I sent him the tripod, the Manfrotto tripod that we like using here at the studio. And when we're out and about, I uh, decided to pick one off, pick one up off uh, the main online shopping outlet that is worldwide. Starts with an A. Found one of those over in the UK and sent them to him. So anyway, glad to hear that tripod is getting put to good use. John Kelly. Well, your name says John Kelly, but Joe from Straight Arrow Fence in Florida. Welcome straight to Arrow Fence in Florida, either John or Joe, whomever you are. I'd like to get down into Florida to see some fence guys. There's, there's a lot of fencing professionals down in that state. I think it'd be worth the trip down there to see you guys. Speaking of the devil, Dan Wheeler, the Fence Industry Podcast. Uh, we got to sit down and record, I think, between, between Fence Tech and uh, State University. I think we recorded three podcasts together, I believe. Uh, had a incredible time it was a really good time to meet dan in person uh if you haven't had a chance if you get the opportunity to meet dan you really should second generation fencing professional up to some really good stuff if you listen to podcasts i would recommend dan's i listen to dan's uh when i'm driving into work in the morning um yeah. really really well done truth seeker I like that name jason from southern harmony south Washington, nashville tennessee it was great seeing at Sandy university last week Jason, it was good to see you. And speaking of Nashville, we have a surprise guest joining us. Good morning. Hi. Caleb, how are you? And I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And I was just telling the audience how Staney University was just a massive success. Um, it was. And it to three days. I mean, it was several hundred professionals all under the same roof. I mean, that alone is is a feat. Yeah, the wind's blowing and knocking stuff over. It is a windy, beautiful day in Nashville. Um, <laughs> man, it's it was a it was a really awesome event. It, um, I, I think, a lot of people that come they don't realize what they're getting. They think they're going to learn how to stain something, but it's such it's so much more. And uh, had had a great time. Very blessed. Very honored to have everybody come and support us. So, already talking about the next one. <laughs> yeah that that was funny i had uh i had texted you about something the week leading up to saning university uh about next year so i was like hey just a suggestion and you're like well we're actually in a meeting right now talking about it like they are talking about next year's before this year's even happened that that is preparation my friend yes sir man looks like you got a full house today yeah 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 we've got a lot of people joining us always good to see always good to see you know Talk, talking about teams for a second, I was saying that, so I, I was out essentially for two weeks between New Orleans and Nashville, 
And uh, so that, that's really a testament to my team for just keeping this thing, keeping the ship headed in the right direction and making progress sort of thing. You yeah. want to talk about teams, though. I got to watch yours work uh, there at Staining University. You want to talk about a well-oiled machine. You, friend, have an incredible, uh, incredible team of, prof of professionals. I agree. I, we have a wonderful team. We're very blessed. It's uh, Couldn't do it without them. No, All it, the credit goes to the team, that's for sure. Well, that's a fair point. I mean, the, the team the team kind of supports itself, right? So it, it, it builds on itself. We talked a lot about this at State University, how it builds itself up. It, it kind of self-polices itself to a certain extent. Yep. Uh, the team is once you get once you get that team configured, it's awesome to sit and watch. I love it, man. It's it's uh it's been a long time coming, that's for sure. Absolutely. It's well, the event was a success, in my opinion. I, in most everyone opinion I talked to yeah. said and, and what's funny is we always have this conversation where we're like, ah, it's never enough time. I wish we had more time. We added yeah. a whole other day. <laughs> whole other day yeah, yeah for sure you <laughs> notice my stain man sticker on my coffee cup here kenny dugan is a graffiti artist <laughs> he uh he stain manned my coffee cup <laughs> i love it i love it so i went ahead and trademarked the name and uh <laughs> and it is on my cup there you go there you go well my <laughs> I, I just have a regular white cap so i need kenny to stop by here and graffiti some stuff for me you better get that off the screen you're supposed to be drinking out of an orange one i know well this morning was a whole thing. So I was telling the audience, I'm not wearing my Joe Evers shirt because they, they are sitting safely at the dry cleaners at the moment. Well, you know, my kids are all wearing your shirts today again. <laughs> we just that makes me back. so happy. Yeah, we just got back from the farm. We were feeding some cows and uh, kids are running around like looking at fences, wearing Ozark fence shirts and hats. <laughs> Ozark fence Nashville. You want me to, you, so you want me to tell the story? I will. Yeah, 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 you bet. Joe was very kind, and, and my son's birthday happened. So he he sent um, an Oza, a, a care package for my son, who just turned seven. And I told him, I said, Joe, you know, I have he has three sisters. You <laughs> might want to send another box for them. So they're in a major fight, because this is like they – Joe Everest is a big thing at our house. <laughs> so we get the box. It comes with all the stuff in it. And all the kids are getting out their pins and their notepads and their hats and their shirts. And then my uh, middle daughter, who's four, you might call you Joe. Would you say she's a pistol? She is. She is. Yeah. She, that's so, a very good way to so describe it. She's her. got all her stuff. She's got her hat on. She's got her shirt thrown over her shoulder. She's got her pin and her notebook. <laughs> and she's digging through the boxes going, where's my orange pants? Where's my orange pants? She's throwing paper everywhere. <laughs> Joe forgot my orange pants. So that was well, a hoot. And, and the funny thing is, I don't know that I've ever worn orange pants, uh, but it, but in her mind, world, it has to be the whole ensemble. Yeah, the whole world pictures you wearing <laughs> orange pants. So right now, you, Joe probably has on orange pants. I've got some bad news. Bad news is it's denim. It's jeans all the way. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> no, that was fun. Ashley sent me the videos of her saying – it, and it was funny. It went from an instant to she was so happy. She had her hat and her shirt. And then the next video was her going, she's digging through the boxes. Yeah. Where's the pants? Where's the pants? Yeah. You, <laughs> you missed the first 60 seconds of it, too. We, we didn't get the fortitude to start filming it until it was too late, really. But it was, it was a classic moment in my house. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, I, I had a really good time with that. I really did get in those videos. Kids are the best. They just, they just really are. And it's the simple things, you know, I mean, that's, I, so I had asked you what Ezra would like for his birthday and, and you, you're like, Joe, I think we both know, like there's a limited amount of space in the house for things. Fair point. Fair point. He said, he'd love a shirt. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I, we've got boxes and shipping. We can make that happen. I'm glad you had reminded me also about the sisters, though, because as soon as you said that, I was like, yeah, that makes that's exactly the way it is at our house. Yeah. One kid gets up and the others are like, where's mine? Well, you know, we don't we don't normally do that participation trophy thing at our house. We don't. Yeah, you don't get a it's not your birthday gift. Um, but yeah. when an Ozark fence box shows up, <laughs> we're watching right now. So, hey, kids. Well. Okay, well, I appreciate you having me out. So one thing we did too is we uh, toured the facility there, the the Sandstill Expert facility. 
I am super impressed with, with just your guys' continued growth over there. I mean, you guys really have a plan, and it's evident. Well, the next plan is to get a bigger boat, but uh, we're uh, we're still still you know. So we have changed. We moved our manufacturing from a different place, mm -hmm. and um, and so to save, I don't want to say to save money, but to save space, we moved manufacturing into another part of our building we weren't using. And then the part where we were doing manufacturing was a big area and uh, it, it enabled us to triple our warehouse space for, for uh, finished products. So, you know, couldn't, couldn't uh, find the $20 million building. It's not quite in the budget. So <laughs> you, know, you, you make do with what you got. And that's what we did. We moved things around a little. You eat the elephant one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. That's the thing. But no, I mean, and and you had shared with me, you guys have taken up, have taken on kind of a, a business coach or coaching program. And do, would that be fair to say a coaching yeah, program? Yeah, certainly. Uh, we have. I think everybody should have a coach. We we yep. work with Petra Coach. Um, yeah. I saw him. Well, me and you saw him. You were there, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're in Nashville. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, a long story short, I do a lot of coaching for myself and books and all these things, and. Um, Tim Milner over at, um, he taught me into getting into the EO entrepreneur organization. It's been great, but it's a long journey because we're, it's like hitching your wagon with a bunch of other business people in your similar yep. bracket, all moving together forward. I wanted something for the whole team. Um, I, well, I didn't know that I did, but I, it didn't become evident to me until I was talking to Tim Milner, Milner and he was telling me how great the extra coaching he was doing with Petra coach was doing for his business. And, um, so I called them and, uh, they said, told them what our plans were. And they said, you know, sounds like we need to do the entire team and we would do this plan and this. And when, when they said it was, um, I'm pretty leery of these things. Sure. So, um, when they said it was uh, a 12 to 18 month deal, they said, you only need us for 12 to 18 months. That kind of caught my ear. There's mm -hmm. a lot of coaches. They want you for life. Um, and yeah. then they said, and there's no contract. If you don't, if you don't like it, you can just get out at any time. Zero, zero contract. And I thought, that's fantastic. Hmm. These guys are pretty, pretty, uh, confident in what they're doing. So yep. we signed up with it and it was not cheap. I mean, it's, it's an investment yep. and my wife wasn't so sure about it. Uh, the bookkeeper wasn't so sure about it <laughs> after the first day and, and then the second day when we did our first strategic planning and quarterly planning session, um, everybody was like, no, this is it. And our team has been aligned so much better after that. So um, Ashley P is watching. She's our office manager. Yeah. Uh, maybe she could chime in with what her thoughts are about it, but it's, it's been a good thing for us and it's just getting started. So I think in order for us to go where we want to go, it's important for us to have somebody who's been there before that can hold her hand along the way. Yeah. You know, a guide in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean that's that's really yeah. kind of what that is, right? Is is a guy that says, "Hey, I've seen this, I've been here, and you know, there's the pitfalls and there's the way through," sort of thing. That's it. It's been a blast. When it, I, when are you signing up? Is the question. I need to. I do. I do. I do. Uh, it was evident you had shared with me that you had you had signed up uh, a few weeks ago, well, maybe a month ago now, but and it made sense as soon as you said, because like, like you had said earlier, we both sat for a day of training with a Petra coach and like just what this guy was able to accomplish with us in a day was pretty fantastic. You know, it was really in the morning, he'd kind of outlined what we were going to accomplish. And I think a decent part of me was a little skeptical of, of this. I was like, okay, I, let's see yeah. if we can get there, but I don't, Sure enough, we were there in time to spare. Yeah. So we signed up with them actually, I think in December. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. And um, it was so busy. We implemented our first quarterly planning session and all this right in the middle of us traveling. So we were literally in, all over the United States. Everybody was gone and, and it still made a huge difference. We've not been here to, to really implement it full speed ahead. So what we've been able to do with limited presence in the office and um, everybody on the move has been with all this, you know, standing university, uh, fence mm -hmm. tech, IBS, all these shows, it's been phenomenal. So I'm, the sky's the limit. I'm excited. Well, I'm if excited. You to have your growth. Coach, I think you should get one. I recommend it highly. 
it's it's on the list for sure. You know, we've got well, I was gonna say we've got quite a few irons in the fire, but Matt Warner at Sandy University uh, reminded us about um, you don't hold irons in the fire; you hand them off and you stoke the fire. Mm-hmm. So need to need to start thinking through that lens or seeing life through that lens. But we've got a new uh, business that we're getting off the ground. Every day we get a little bit closer to the lift off there. So I think it's on the list for sure. I want to. I want to get teams built out first before we start bringing yeah. that in, but definitely one of the first first few action items uh, on there is bringing Petra in because it's they they do really good work for sure. Yeah, and there may be some other ones out there. You know, we're sure we're, we don't get anything out of it if you use them, but I do recommend them. You know, yeah. And I and I've been in other coaching programs, um, mm-hmm. but so so to give everybody an idea about it, so you can you can actually do this on your own. Um, here is here is my number one most hard to consume book not it's it's not a fun read yeah it's not a bad read but it's very this is detailed this is the book um so we so so part of what petra coach does is they uh sounds like a commercial here but i'll tell you because i believe in this if you'll notice it's called mastering the rockefeller habits Mm 2.0 so all the guys in eo that had really really grown their businesses very successful they said well really we just mastered the rockefeller habits that's really what we got focused on and that's what we did and and i had read this book so i opened it up again and read it and i was a terrible student in school but if you want to look at my copy you see all the highlighted stuff in here yeah that's very i've never done that in a book before but it was important for me to do it in this book and uh when you read this it will it will really 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 change your life Um, because it's, I don't know how to describe it any better. Um, but so, and there's a whole framework you can do with this. There's pages and and sheets and all this stuff that comes with this. And this is a cheap book. You can buy it anywhere. And we did it on our own and we sort of got at a roadblock. We were like, yeah, this is kind of tough. I'm not quite sure here. And we sort of put it in the parking lot for a little while and just didn't mess with it for a little bit. It was always on the back of my mind. And when I found out that Petra Coach, what they do is teach you how to master the Rockefeller habits, um, and it kept coming up around these successful people, I was all in. That's that's when that's what flipped the switch for me because I knew the impact this book had made on me, but I didn't know how to implement it. Um, I could implement one thing, but not the other. And so having sure. somebody come in that that taught that it's you you'll watch our trajectory it's going to change our trajectory it's going to be massive growth for our business and we're going to be able to figure things out and help other people with it so i'm really excited but if you want to do it this is uh this book is 1999 and i recommend it very very i can't recommend it high enough so it's gonna go on my amazon list once we're done yeah Uh, don't don't listen to it read it read it okay physically read this one and it's a slow read and get a highlighter out and there's probably 200 book recommendations in this book (laughs) Uh, and and i got all the books to go with it you know because it's this book is solid you know it's solid stuff you know there's something to the rockefeller habits Mm -hmm. uh and and what's interesting at least here locally is they're teaching it in school now um so my daughter when she was in fifth grade fourth grade fifth grade something like that um they didn't call they don't call it the rockefeller habits in school they call it I don't know what they, there's something, you know, like the, the lead, the habits of leadership or we are the leaders or something like that. Well, but she started coming home and she's like, yeah, you know, you start with the end in mind and that's like, wait, huh? Like that sounds familiar. Yeah. And, yeah. It's in, in sharpen the saw and, and it's like, wait a minute. These are, so they're teaching Rockefeller habits in elementary school and now they're building on it. No. So fast forward, she's in seventh grade now, which do i i mean i'm sure she hasn't skipped a grade but it doesn't seem that long ago that she was in third and fourth grade um but now they're building yeah. on it in middle school and i if, bet if you, want me to, if you want me to read out what the record you know the the habits checklist is i can read it if you want absolutely absolutely it's it's long so but but i'm just going to hit the bullet points sure so the executive team is healthy and aligned Makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, so, and I'm, I'm going to read some bullet points under that. Team members understand each other's differences, priorities, and styles. You got to know who you're working with, right? Yep. 
Team, team meets frequently for strategic thinking. Team participates in ongoing executive education. Team is able to engage in constructive debates and all members feel comfortable participating. You know, you and your dad have probably gotten into some pretty tough, heated debates, but it all worked out, right? That's so right. A strong team needs to be able to do that and then go fishing afterwards, right? Right. So right. Still be friends. I'm, so I'm just going to read the bullet points from here on out. So everyone is aligned with the one thing that needs to be accomplished this quarter to move the company forward. So I would get so tied down and busy with, I need to do all these things, but what is the one thing this quarter that yeah. if the one thing that we have to do in order to hit our year goal, in order to hit our three year goal and uh, communication rhythm is established and information moves through the organization accurately and quickly. One of the things we do is a morning huddle at 8.28 uh, a.m. And so all the department heads get together and they basically say, what did I do yesterday? What did I do today? Or what am I going to do today? What's the most uh, important priority? Number one thing I have to do today and where am I at on my, maybe each person has roughly about three things that they're accountable for that are long-term business priorities and say, I'm 10% done on this one or whatever. Yeah. One of mine is like core values and core purpose. Um, every facet of the organization has a person assigned with accountability for ensuring goals are met. So being accountable and being the doer is not necessarily the same thing. Sure. Um, ongoing employee input is collected to identify obstacles and opportunities. So we want to keep our pulse on our business, right? No, yeah. you know, something needs to change or something's bad or good. Um, record, reporting and analysis of customer feedback data is as frequent and accurate as financial data. So people listening, wow. you guys probably get a text message from us that says, how likely are you to, re, you know, to recommend yeah. staying until experts to friends or family? That's wow. kind of one of those things. Um, core values and purpose are alive in an organization. So one of my friends, so core values is kind of hard to understand for a lot of people, but a friend of mine has core values. I won't tell you what ours are, but a friend of mine has his and it's swag. They've got hashtag swag all over the walls and it's speed, willingness, accountability, and growth. Okay. So you bring everything back. Hey, are you doing this with speed? Are you doing this? Are you being accountable? Uh, account, are you, <clears throat> are you doing this with a growth mindset? And so mm -hmm. all your decisions in your business, all the things you do, um, are related to the core values not not joe you didn't get this project done on time it's joe did you do this with speed and willingness and accountability no man you didn't get it done what can we do to fix that instead of me fussing at you we're holding people accountable to the core values because that's our core values so when we made our core values our team came together and made them it wasn't me does that make sense yeah absolutely it does but it, but it makes it to where because everybody knows we have things we have to do and nobody wants to fuss at somebody for not getting things done. It's right. like, Hey, look, our, our core values is customer service. You know, that's very cliche, but always sure. doing the right thing. Or, if, you know, I heard another one um, from a company is don't let the leopards out. And they were a company like a service business and they were, okay. you could, you could say it was a fence company and they were working at a zoo and, somebody in their company noticed the lion, the, the leopard gate was left open. And so they went above and beyond by going over there, closing the leopard gate, telling somebody what happened. And so that's one of their core values is don't let the leopards out, which basically means, Hey, always go above and beyond for a customer because you, 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 your core values are like legends in your business, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the leopard cage. Right. So, and we want to around that. And let's see, employees can articulate the following key components of the company strategy accurately. So the things your team needs to know is what's your big, hairy, audacious goal, right? For 10, 25 years down the road, what, who our core customer is. That's important. Yeah. Um, three brand promises and then your elevator pitch. You know, there's a couple of things that everybody needs to know. All employees can answer quantitatively whether they had a good day or week. That's important. Quantitatively, quantitatively is the key word in that phrase, yeah. I believe. Mm -hmm. Did you get what you were supposed to get done this week? Was it good or bad? Well, because let, let me ask you, how many what? times this happens to me pretty frequently? I'll come home and Taylor say, "Well, how was your day? How oh, was a good day? What'd you What'd you do today?" Oh well, uh, I I'm sure I did a lot. I feel like I was very busy, but I can't put my finger on the two or three things. Uh, you know, so quantitatively. 
makes sense. Like, was it a good day? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I accomplished a lot. Good. But yeah, it felt good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. And the last one is a company's plans and performance are visible to everyone. Um, so interesting. So there's just a whole lot to it. And, you you know, imagine if you were doing all of these. When I first opened this book and looked at it and, and I saw this list because I just read the bullet points. Where is it? You can see each bullet point has a little checkbox beside of it. There are 10. So there's 40 things here. There's 40 boxes to check. If you were doing all of those in your business, I thought it would be impossible and maybe take 10 years to implement it. Um, but I can see by the end of this year, every one of these things will be pretty solid, solid as a rock. And we're already doing all of them, but they will be solid as a rock and 10 at the end of the month, at the end of the year. So, Interesting. and I recommend it. I recommend it highly. It's, it's going to change. Gonna, like I said, it's going to go on my it's, Amazon list when I get uh, yeah, off this today. It's going to change our whole, it's changing our whole world, man. And it really is. Well, and you, and you can see it when you walk through. So, like I said, you had told me about this before we had talked mm -hmm. about it in depth, but, but walking through your facility, just in how things were, I mean, obviously laid out and organized. Now, not that they weren't organized earlier, but you could tell everything has a reason, right? Like it, there's a reason this thing is right here, right? Like it, it just makes sense to have, it's part of the flow, it's part of the efficiency. And then of course, signs that are hung both downstairs and upstairs. Um, it, I was looking around, I was like, okay, I see that like the whole team has just adopted it, right? Like they, they're all involved with it, which is incredibly important, but well, I they think made it. they made it. It's not me. It's, it's the team. It's our, our team. So team means everything to us. So of course. yeah, it's, it's pretty cool getting everybody. So when everybody, so the big shift for me was on the strategic planning day when I got to see everybody passionately talking about the things um, in the, the same way that I would talk about it, the same way I would defend things, you know, in our business. Well, hey, no, wait a minute. This is, we believe in this and we do this. They were doing the same thing. And I was like, wow, wow. But we've got a good team, Joe. I mean, yeah. people are not everyday, but they're not average people. We've got really solid people here. And uh, yeah. so really good people and really good plan. We're using this one. It's, it's been a good thing. It really is. I had the chance to sit, to talk with I, almost everyone there. Uh, and you could tell like everyone's aligned. Everyone is on the same page and headed the right direction, um, which is important, right? If you want to shoot a rocket into space, all the engines have to be perfectly aligned. Mm -hmm. But then so this, I was watching this documentary. It was uh, back when NASA was still sending ships into space. They were talking about the alignment of the engines is within millimeters. Like they are all perfectly laser focused on this one spot that's like so many meters behind the behind the spacecraft, behind this rocket they're shooting in the space. And for me, like that, I had to go back and rewatch it. Like that's interesting that these engines are like massive. Right. Like you're moving, you're moving a, a 12 or 15 story building into space. Like it's going to take a lot, but they're, but they're so laser focused. They would, it would have to be in, in probably more tighter than thousands, you know, for them to all be focused on the same place. Yeah. It, and it was crazy. What was it? It was like, I don't know. It was like well, a, you a know, when, you're, when you're flying an airplane, if you get off one degree, you're yeah. way off course at the end of your journey. Imagine in space where there's no gravity fighting against you and you're off one one thousandth on one of your engines. I think I, uh -huh. I see how it could blow the whole by the time you get to Mars, that's like 15 light years in the wrong direction, isn't it? Well, yeah, but the point they were making, so it was like the size of a quarter or something, okay. so many meters behind the spaceship that these engines are are directing all the thrust towards this one specific spot. And for me, I don't I don't know what listen, I'm a fence guy, I'm not a rocket scientist, obviously. However, I was like, well, surely like the thrusters just point down, right? When you watch the, when you watch the videos of these things lifting off, you don't think laser precision, you know, alignment on these thrusters. I mean, they're just throwing massive amount of energy at the earth to propel this thing up. They are so the, the size of a quarter, these things are laser focused into anyway, that, that resonated with me and. Can you imagine the being like 
sending your rocket out with Joe on the front of it. And he's like, well, Joe's never coming back. We had that one a little while. <laughs> Maybe the next one will uh, straighten it up. Yeah, they're like, hey, how's the alignment on the on the uh, thrusters? We're like, well, they're pointed down. So that's that's the direction we need them to point it down. So I go up. Like, yeah. Ooh, well, actually, you need them laser focus on the size of a quarter. Like, oh, didn't know that. But uh, but I think that I think that aligns with what we're talking you know, about. So. You know, it would be cool to have somebody come on your show and that was maybe from the space program or an engineer who worked on something like that, and just to talk about the. Uh, the the control the self control that they had to have to be sure that they got that right before they launched. Yeah, it, this show would be more than two and a half hours because I've got some questions and for yeah, like, that would be neat. So if you know any astronauts or any uh, space engineers, <laughs> rocket scientists, seriously, I think that'd be a great show. To, not to talk about the yes. details of the thing, but the the, no. the mindset. Well, yeah. So let's bring this all back around. Can you imagine the the teamwork that's involved in a project like that, mm -hmm. right? You've got layers and layers and layers of management. So in teams that are thousands of people deep, I bet if you looked at the whole, every person that had an influence on a space launch is probably thousands of people, I would bet. So all of those people coming together to make sure one thing happens and that's this thing gets into space safely, I guess two things and it comes back safely. But um, yeah, man, it, how, well, let's that would just be call awesome. Elon and see if he'll talk to us for a little while, and then maybe yeah. we can pitch him the idea of the uh, the uh, electric truck pulse hole auger. <laughs> There's something there. I really think, like, hey, when you're done with this Cybertruck business, and please get done with that because I've been on the list for like three years. Um, when you're done with this Cybertruck business, augers is where it's at. We need a Tesla auger for sure. Yeah, but. but man, uh, so there's, have you heard of that. this platform yeah. called Masterclass? Yeah, yeah, I have. So I signed the team up for it. Me and the team all have access to it. Um, and they, and the reason I say this is because they, they have space exploration on there. And I, that's on my list. So I've been watching. So uh, there's the book, Never Split the Difference. Uh, it's a guy, he was an FBI negotiator. And then he went on to have his own firm. He's on Masterclass. And so yeah, it was. Probably. It, it was basically like it he just expands on that book and uses like real world uh some you get to hear some real world negotiations it's crazy that is one of my favorite books it makes so much sense yeah it really a, does a really good book you need to read it once a year in my opinion or three times I, a year i agree i agree but then uh so right now i'm in the middle of the uh, CEO of Starbucks, the president and CEO right. of Starbucks, talking about their growth and expansion. Um, specifically, right now, what I'm finding interesting is their expansion into China. Um, so China is very uh, family focused, right? So there, so he came at it from a corporate philosophy. Like, hey, here our business meetings, our business meetings. So in China, the business meetings involve all the family. Like, if you're going to have so in your instance, if you were going to have a, an executive meeting, you would have executive meeting with all of your team and their parents and, and significant others. Imagine the wisdom you get to draw on. Bingo. Bingo. That's exact. That's exactly what he's talking about. As he said, at first I thought we're going to have an, ex an ex he didn't call it. I forget what they call their, their all hands meetings, but he said with a thousand people in an auditorium, like how could that be productive? And that's exactly what he got to was, well, now, wait a minute. You have generational information here that gets passed down generation to generation to generation. Why are you talking about story? So that's, that was, I'm in the middle of that. That was really kind of interesting. That is awesome. Sounds like you got a little helper there. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> You're not ready for TV yet. You go. <laughs> <laughs> This is ready. all right. You stay off the camera, but you say, Joe, where's my pants? Joe, where's my pants? Oh no, oh no, all right. go, 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 go. <laughs> Little feet. So yeah. that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I got one for you when you finish that one. It's called Love is Free, Guac is Extra. It's okay. about, okay, um, it is by 
the former CEO of Chipotle, Monty Moran, Monty Moran, how um, basically how they went from like a couple of restaurants to one of the biggest in the world and how they built teams. And uh, it was recommended to me by my coach. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Love so far, is free, so walk is extra. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting book. I've got a, I need to start carving out. So I've, I've been implementing some time management uh, on my calendar just to try to ensure like my stuff gets done. Get any uh, advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing I'm having difficulty with is sticking with it. You know what I mean? Like it's, I've got time blocks, right? So, but people, people pop in and need a minute, which is encouraged. You want that. Mm -hmm. but it's never a minute, you know? So here's what, so you, you mentioned daily huddles. Here's something that of all places I found on TikTok last night, as I was scrolling through, uh, I'm on like, I'm on somehow I found out how to get, I'm on business management, TikTok. I don't know how I got there, but I hope I get to stay there. But one of them was a, um, a wealth manager. And he said, Hey, his key to success is morning huddles. No less than 15 minutes, no more than 30 minutes is, is where kind of his sweet spot is. So someone pops in to ask, like, hey, I got a question. And his the first question is, can it wait for the huddle? Like, can it wait for tomorrow's huddle? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if the answer is yes, then it does. because and, and he had said, here's the reason. One, I'm safeguarding my time because it takes – this guy had – he's a numbers guy. He said it takes me 11 minutes to get back on task. It, from once I stop handle something else that takes 11 minutes mm -hmm. for you to get focused back in on what I'm doing. So if you, if that happens six times, I've wasted an hour just trying to get back on task. But the other thing it did was it helped him teach the team, right? Cause his point is if this person has a question, there's probably two or three other people that have a similar question. So I can teach the group what that answer looks like rather than answering it several, several times individually. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I like that one. Um, we do we do the five minute huddle or not five minute, but a morning huddle. Yeah. And and it and if if something goes back and forth, so if I say Joe, ask you a question, you respond, and then I clarify. I think if it's two or three times after a certain point, hey, let's take this offline because we're wasting everybody else's time. Me and you will handle this together, and yep. that's important. Um, Another one that some of my team probably sees me do, I learned from an, from an old guy in EO. He said he used to hate it when people do, did this to him, but it was a lesson. And they would say, if somebody came up to me and bas basically went around the chain of command, if that makes sense, not that we want a super structured chain of command. We want our doors open in our office. I don't even have a door. No. But, but for instance, let's say if somebody in, in service comes and asks me a question, um, but they didn't ask the service manager, Mandy. I would say, you know what? That's a great question. Let's go ask Mandy. And 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 to, the point is to build that communication between teams so that they can yeah. understand that hey, you have the power here. You're empowered to do to do your thing, and yep. uh, and I support your decision, even if it's a wrong one. You know, so sure. And uh, so it's it's interesting. It's uh, they sure don't teach this stuff in school. They don't, they don't, but we know the Pythagorean theorem, you know what I mean? Like it's, I don't, sorry. It's the whole crazy stuff, but, um, so here's another one for you. Like, this is like, just, I guess, tips and tricks on business right now is what we're up to. But, uh, Matt Warner taught me this one and, and we talked about this actually on Don, uh, Don, Dan Wheeler's podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, someone you, you're not allowed to bring problems. Right. You can't bring a problem. You have to bring three solutions. You know, well, I guess I guess technically you do bring the problem, but he's not providing the solution. He's picking from three solutions or two solutions, whatever. Um, but it gets people thinking about the solution ahead of time. Who what I uh, maybe it's Tom Reber. Um you have when you bring a problem to Tom, now it's been years since he had told me this, but basically you have to walk him through what you've already tried, right? Like what, what are the three things you've already tried to get through this and what roadblocks have you hit trying to, you know, 
basically getting people to think outside of, well, let me just take the problems to Joe is, well, let me try to solve them real quick. And then if I hit, you know, whatever, two to three roadblocks, then I take it to him and we try to, we try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think those, those things are all related. You know what I mean? Is that you want to try to, you, tr you want to try to train, you know, solutions. There's solution minded individuals rather than, yeah. than problem finders. There's some more to that too. I think that's great. I love that. But there's also, um, I learned somewhere that your the brain is wired to respond to no quickly to no yeah here's the solution much so for instance joe the track came off of the bobcat what do you want us to do so now joe's going well have you done this have you done this have you done that have you done that in versus joe the track fell off the bobcat we're going to get a brand new track and have the cat guy come out and get it you want us to do that no use the rock bar pop it back on there and get it going is instead you know so the yeah. brain responds to know better and, and this translates into sales so when people call you up and they say hey joe did i catch you at a good time you say yes it's better to say and this is chris voss it's better to say so when i call joe i say hey joe did i catch you at a bad time yep. oh no it's a good time so if you say no your brain tends to be in a better it's weird if your brain's in a better place you know if you've ever gotten a call from me, it usually starts that way. Yeah. Like, hey, buddy, did I catch you at a bad time? No? Great. All right. I need about, I need about five minutes. Da, 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 da. I started yeah. out that way all the time. because yeah. then, it, it, And it's also a great opportunity, though. You know, Caleb, we've done this before. We're all call you like, hey, did I catch you at a bad time? And it gives you the opportunity to say, actually, yes, because this, that, and the other. Can I call you back in 15, 20 minutes? Yeah. Perfect rather than me launch straight into whatever I need to talk about. And then you're waiting for me to take a breath. So then you can cut yeah. in with, Hey, listen, I'm in the middle of this. I need to call you back. Yeah. Nothing's worse than not that it's, I, I guess it is a bad thing. I guess it probably is rude. Nothing's worse than when you answer the phone and the, someone immediately goes into telling you, I need a fence. It's this, that. but I guess when they call you, you know, it's, they expect you to be there listening, but it's yeah. tough when somebody calls you and they just go right in and pour it all over you and you don't even have time to detach from what you're working on. Yep. Yep. I we agree. should do more staining universities, man. We learned so much. That's the thing is, and we've got a few more on the calendar. Uh, we're, we're working on getting them on the calendar. Uh, man, you know, I said I was not going to do another one until next year. And so far in the last week, I'm going to do another one with Precision Pro Wash guys, the Gutter Butter guys, and Ron Musgrave yep. from Nashville probably in a month. We're going to do one at the Power Wash store in Nashville. We're going to do um, one with you and a few others up in Pennsylvania. Yep. We're going to do uh, Dallas. One, up. Where well, else? There's one that I got an email about um, that we had talked about at the Honky Tonk in North Carolina. Or it's in North yeah, yeah, July. You talk about it at the Honky Tonk in Nashville yeah. about an event in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. July there. And mm -hmm. uh golly, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. But you know, here and here's why here's why we do it. And I and I will speak for you because we we've talked about this for so many times. It's how how much how can we scale the education? Right? Like how impactful can we make this? Mm -hmm. So when someone comes up, they're like, hey. I've got an idea. I'd love for you guys to come out. It's like, Oh, I, the answer is yes. But now I got to go home and tell mama bear about this because I yeah. told her <laughs> we were yeah. going to be home more. Well, I'm going to try to really focus on one days. I mean, one yeah. days and half days, quick ones, because you can't eventually, um, you gotta, you gotta get back and fly the ship. So, but yeah. Well, think you, and, and here's what I'm learning is you also have to safeguard your time. Right. You, your time, you don't get it back. Now mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the, I'm not saying that these events aren't worthwhile. I love them. I think they are incredibly worthwhile. I think they're worth doing. That's why the answer is yes. But, but we also have to realize we've got a team at home that, you know, me and our family that also needs us, needs us there too. Yeah. So I propose we take a poll from the audience and say, why don't we start with, of course we did this. We'll see when it all goes out, but these, sh I think we should live stream these. I think we should record these 
um, and put them out, um, yeah. you know, full, full long form content and then the, then nuggets and, and put it out like that. And I think we can touch more people with it. Um, That's maybe, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Especially with the technology, the way it is, is there's no reason why we couldn't do this whole situation, uh, bring in several more people, but, but kind of accomplish uh, a pretty similar, pretty similar thing, right? Like we've got the chat here down the side. I am getting to you chat, but where people can ask questions, that sort of thing, we can invite in speakers. We can do the whole thing because here's the thing with on sites. One, I, like I said, I love them because I get to meet people face to face, but a one day event means it's three days, right? You've got the travel the day before you have the event, you travel home the day after. So it's a minimum, it's two days on top of whatever the training event is, mm -hmm. right? So, and you and I are having this conversation right now on, uh, we're going to social media marketing world here in a couple of weeks. And it's travel in, do the event, travel out. Now, you're a lucky dog because you get to fly direct. And I am incredibly jealous of that. I got to um, fly to LA. And well, then to San Diego, and but I'm flying direct back. But I may, I may, I may actually get a car in LA and go visit some. We've got a lot of dealers over there, and I'm probably end up doing that. I thought about that this morning, but yeah. So I'm know. actually taking a. I need, and we can talk about this offline. But so the day after the event, uh, so what is the 17th? So this the event is the 14th, 15th, 16th. On the 17th. Uh, we're going up to LA, east of LA, um, to see uh, Burgandy, the chain link uh, machinery manufacturer. But, uh, so my wife just texted me. I'm direct always. I have an excellent travel agent. <laughs> I'm, yeah, it, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Yeah, I'm not sure where Ventura. So we got Ventura, California. Where is that close to LA? Let's see, because I need to get to Ontario, which yeah, so is also in I, California. I may, I may actually pull it in on the back end. So Ontario is close to Riverside. It's uh, east of LA, um, and Fence Factory is west of LA, um, but they have eight, seven or eight locations. So nice. That would, that's a hundred and fifty million dollar fence company um, in Supply House. So they're a big outfit. And yep. uh, some really, 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 really good people. And um, they sell our stain and we private label it for them. I'm, I'm sure yep. they don't mind saying it because we've got a great product and uh, we make their product for them. It's the same stuff in our, that's in our buckets and yep. we're going to go see them. And so if you're listening on the West coast, I really appreciate it. If you support the guys at our fence factory, because they are some really good people, good folks. Absolutely. And and they're black belts in judo, which is really cool. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, hey, Caleb, let's say hi to a few people here in the chat, because I know there's some that have been waiting for a little bit. Zach's here from Straight Away, from State Straight Arrow Fence in Orlando, finally able to watch live. Zach, welcome. Now, this one, all right, so this is getting talked about in the chat, and I don't know what it means. Uh, I see you lunchbox. I'm not, I haven't heard this term before. So, but then truth seeker says, we got to know the story behind the nickname lunchbox. I don't know. Or maybe they're calling someone else lunchbox in the chat. We need clarification on what this is. All right. I think we both know this isn't Harvey Wallbanger from Coos Bay, Oregon. This is Kenny Dugan. Kenny, what are you doing? It's always good to see Kenny. So Kenny was at Sandy university I just, I like being around Kenny. You know, I feel smarter when I'm in his presence. He's just, he's one of these just, I don't want to say mad scientists because that term might not be positive, but that's what Kenny is. He's like, he's always testing. He's always trying this and that and the other. Uh, when, well, perfect think, case in point. And we were Kenny talking about spends, coming out. What's uh, that? I was going to say, I think Kenny spends much of his time like this. Uh -huh. I wonder is his yeah, like key phrase. Yeah. Well, when we were when we were talking about coming out to visit your facility uh, after the university, uh, well, he was like, "Well, I want to come out because I want to test this and that and the other. Do you have these things? I want to I want to do some testing on these." 
when I get home. Like this guy is always testing. He's always trying. Uh, I like I said, I feel smarter just for being in his presence because I, you know, if you ask him a question, he's already tried it. Like he, he's to the point now where he's trying like crazy stuff. So the basic stuff, he's like, oh yeah, no, I, I tried that. I know exactly what you need to do. Yeah, this, and, and, and you reminded me of the test he wanted me to do. And Kenny, I will do that for you. I will call you and do that. There you go. There you go. Truth seeker knows the truth that this is actually Kenny, not Harvey Wallbanger. John Kelly says, my partner, Zach from Straight Arrow, will have to tell that one. Okay. Dan Wheeler is here. He's a podcast man. I'll check out Mr. Fence. Speaking of training professionals who were at the Sanding University, Sean was there as well. You know, Sean's one of these guys where he can give he can give a talk on half a hundred different subjects. You know, so I don't know who's responsible for this, but we'll figure it out. It's at every one of these events, it rains. Everyone. Like, I don't know. There's a common well, denominator here somewhere. We're busy staining when it's not raining, so we could never do the event when it's not <laughs> When it's nice. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's true. But uh, so – we, we were hoping to build some fence to, to actually get some hands on. We, we got the opportunity last year to build some fence, but this year is just raining down. So Sean's like, yeah, no problem. I'll give a talk on uh, discounting and knowing your numbers and why discount actually costs you more than the discount. Like, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, we, we have big, big, big plans to make it to where stating university is weatherproof. So I think we got some, some cool things coming down the pipeline for that. Definitely interested to hear about that. Susie Wells is here with us. Susie, happy Saturday to you. She has been to New Orleans. She has. She has. We saw her there. Sean King is sitting at a track meet right now. I think his son's running, so hopefully your son is doing well. Harrison Hart uh, from Converse, Texas. It's kind of a cool-sounding town. Harrison Hart. There, we know this guy. We know Christian. It was an amazing event. It was indeed. It was indeed. Vero Fence. Hello, back at you. Hello. Bethany was there. Hello, new friends. Dexta Halls had a great time attending Standing University. It was very good meeting you guys, seeing you guys again there at the event. She has a question for you, Caleb. How's 75 hard going? I'm I'm on day whatever day it is. I'm yeah. I'm I've done 75 hard three or four times. Sheesh. That's it's time that management. Mental that fortitude is, there. That is it. It is time management. Nothing else. That's why. That's why I killed this court uh -huh. before the coffee started, and um, rode a bike yesterday. Did squats. Walked for 45 minutes with my wife uh, after the kids nice. went to bed. Ate good. Do it every day, man. What I noticed while I was there, you have some of the workout gear outside. Oh, so yeah. You can get some of the outside workout in. Yep. Got to do it. Ashley P is here with us. Hello, Ashley. Billy Grove is also with us. What's up, guys? Gulf Coast Fence Solutions checking in in Pensacola. Billy, good morning, sir. Good morning, Billy. I bet it's nice in Pensacola at the moment. It must be nice, right? <laughs> I, I bet he's never heard that before. <laughs> these florida guys you know they're like so tired of here and it's like yeah but come over here in the summer when it's 100 degrees and a million percent humidity like i'll yeah. trade you then but everybody's got a pool and that there is the ocean so I mean. sam, sam filled us in on that sam filled us in on the key strategy of having a pool in your backyard yeah madison jordan good morning good morning madison we know madison and jimmy they were also at the event Good morning. Actually, P says I was for, so this is uh, in regards to uh, Petra. She was skeptical at first, but after the one meeting, everyone could benefit from it. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably, I think that's probably what it takes, right? Is, is, you know, because in, and skepticism is healthy. I believe, I, I believe skepticism is healthy. So I think that's right, but get a meeting in, I think, so I, I obviously know because we sat at that one day training. Like I know what Petra is capable of. I think it is a really good system. Uh, but someone that hasn't been through that, 
like I said, I was skeptical that first day when they told us what we're going to accomplish. I think it's easy to be skeptical, but sit through it for a day for a meeting and then uh, get figured out. Let's see. So Christian says the meetings are intense, but I have a definitely seen a shift and all of us for sure. Absolutely worth it. Zach says he just bought the book on Amazon. It'll be at his door tonight. How does that work? Don't get in a hurry with it. Take yeah. your time. This is, yeah. and, and then read it. And then it's a reference book. There you go. I thought I was pretty slick when we were getting, we get stuff next day here now sometimes. So we've got a big fulfillment center uh, just outside of town. I thought that was pretty slick. I ordered, I uh, ordered something for the office and it showed up the next day. And I was like, Hey, hey we're going, getting somewhere. And then I see Zach says he gets it tonight. So I'm like, well, Never mind. We got we got room to grow here. Harry Smith, hello. Harry Smith says DNJ says thanks for the tripod. Kale, have you watched DNJ projects on YouTube? I've seen them a few times. Yeah, those those guys are incredible guys to watch. They spell like tripod wrong though. You know these British guys. I mean, I don't understand. Them. <laughs> that could be correct. That could be correct. There, you never know. It's the what I struggle with with is the word gray. There are two spellings of gray, and they are both technically correct. Yes. So it might be the same for tripod. I prefer the A. I go A, yeah. Good morning, Michael. Hope you're having a good day. Gregory Schofield says, what's appropriate stretch on the fabric of a four-foot fence? Yep, that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. Well, you pinch it, and if you don't get much... So let's 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 quantitate this. Quantitate is that the word? Quantify this. Uh, so like less than quarter inch give when you squeeze it. Does that sound about right, Caleb? Um, well, I would have to feel it. It's been a while, but yeah, yeah. you don't want it to move. You know, you when you stick right. your finger in the diamond mesh, you squeeze it, and you don't want it to. You don't want it to squeeze because it's going to yeah. sag. It's not going to be tight enough. Yep. And, um you know, on a four you, foot fence, it could be. This is one thing I'm learning after the chain link videos. Um, four foot fence. So, in our market, and I will start this there in our market, 11 and a half gauge is common for four foot residential fences. Yeah, same here. Well, Caleb, I said that in one of the videos, and I was informed that the standard in most other places is nine gauge at four foot. I would argue that that and say that that's debatable. I mean, yeah. everywhere I've ever been, it was it was eleven and a half. Eleven now, and a half. When you, when you see a nine gauge four foot fence, it's impressive, and it's sure. I think it should be the standard because uh, obviously it's going to last much longer. But yeah, maybe and he could be talking about um, vinyl coated because vinyl coated is what eleven and a half gauge core and then nine gauge finish. Uh, gee, so well, and that that probably varies. So the stuff we get is eleven gauge core, eight gauge finish. Yeah, um, so that. That but, would make some sense. It, it, so anyway. all this is going to vary. This answer, the squeeze answer, is going to vary depending on because nine gauge is not going to squeeze. Like it's tight. Eleven and a half, there'll be a little bit of gift. Will be a little bit of yeah. gift. But I think it's good that it's different in different places. That means there are many different manufacturers out there making stuff, and that means yeah. that somebody's going to come up with something really cool one day, right? So yep, yep. There there's some cool stuff on the horizon. So we've got some videos planned um midsummer midsummer there's a there's a i don't want to say much more there's something cool on the horizon not with us it's with a different company we're going to go travel and see them but yep adam sims freedom fence what's going on fellas adam i wore your hat the other day and it got a lot of compliments around the office there's a lot i wore his hat for two minutes and it was immediately stolen from me because it was so (laughs) cool and i no longer have the hat but oh no (laughs) Well, I was watching one of Sean's videos last night. Sean was wearing the hat. These hats are, uh, they're getting popular. Yeah. Michael Bain. We know this guy. What's that book called, Joe? What? Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. I think that's what you're talking about when that popped up. Bingo. Never Split the Difference. It it is, it, it is a life book. I think, I mean, it's geared towards a business conversation, but it's a life book. It really is. Very well said. Yep. It's in it. 
so not to give the book away, right? But I mean, there's no massive secrets in there. It's, it's presented in a really good way. But one of the things is um, kind of repeating. If you want to dig into it, you you would just repeat the last phrase or last sentence in the conversation. So, Caleb, if you and I are talking and you're like, you know, um, or I guess you'd repeat the key phrase. He says the last phrase, but I think it's the key phrase. You, when this comes up is if, Caleb, if you were the fence customer and you'd say, you know, Joe, I, I got your bid and, you know, it, you came in twice as high as your competitor. Twice as high. Bingo. Yeah. Mirror. Then let me expand on it. Now, I guess, so I guess his way would, so the last phrase too is, I guess another question you could say is, my competitor? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so-and-so over at, at such such fence. Michael Bain could be dangerous if you read that book. You better look out. <laughs> we, well, we might, we might be, uh, we might be, you know, setting him up for something here, but never split the difference. I think it's a great book. Got to be Evelyn. She's the pistol for sure. You know, well, I'll just say, I I hold a little bit of uh, I don't animosity is a, a, the wrong word, but uh, I gotta watch that one because the last year when I was there at your shop, I had some very nice brownies baked for me and they were very good. And I had one and and I had a plate. It was and I set it down on the chair next to me and we were all talking about business. And I go to pick the plate up gone brownie's gone and and uh, you could tell evelyn is one of the younger children because that brownie disappeared quick i mean he's just gone like oh can't take it back already gone and there's like little crumbs like uh, gotta keep our eye on her for sure yeah, i'll never put out the fire in her though i love it <laughs> no 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 I, that's the thing. Like, <laughs> it's gonna be fun watching her grow up because yeah She's going to, she's going to set the world on fire. That is for sure. Fishing and Pickens filling us in on the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's the theory. So, and yeah, I, I got to expand on it. it. I think we should probably be teaching some different things in school. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's yeah. That's a whole different conversation. Testing next week. We got some plans next week. Yeah. Got to carve out time. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Brent Mitch, for, speaking of California fellows, Brent Mitch is here. Sea Wolf thirteen. Yeah, Sea Wolf. So, uh, Brent has Brent also has so this YouTube page, Sea Wolf thirteen. He does. Uh, so he he and I go way back, but he lives out in California. He does a lot of um, spear fishing and, oh, and free okay. and. Uh, maybe not free diving, but like hand hand fishing for lobster. Pretty crazy to watch. Yeah. I enjoy it. The sea wolves were uh, were um, helicopter pilots that went into the stuff back in Vietnam, dropping off Navy SEALs and Special Forces guys. I thought he might have been one of those sea wolves. There's some there's some cool books about those guys if you like stuff like that. Interesting. Sea wolves. Brent, is there something there? Mitchell Gregory, he was with us as well. Enjoyed San Diego University. Love these lives as well. Mitch, Mitchell's a multi-generational fence guy. Uh, we met Mitchell last year and uh, had a great conversation with him and his dad just kind of about, you know, what, what it looks like to transition from one generation to another. Um, it was funny is the more we talked, the more like they had it figured out. Like they, they just need a little bit of affirmation that they did indeed have it figured out. Mm -hmm. You know, they're having the, they're having all the right conversations about, you know, setting expectations and what does this look like? The whole thing. Um, I think it's funny that, that we as people do that quite a lot, right? We look for affirmation that, you know, and, and so kind of bring this back around to business coaches. I think a lot of times, a lot of times their job is just affirming what we're doing, right? Maybe we'd like a little tweak on it, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. So they, Mitchell Gregory and his father are up to good stuff. We know this guy, Dan Blanc, the fence king. Somebody called uh, him the the mayor. Who was Dan? I, I was listening to Dan Wheeler's podcast and uh, mayor of New Orleans or something like that. So I got an I, idea. I think that's yeah. right. He he should at minimum be like the. Um, 
oh, what do you, what would you call it? The uh, ambassador, he's the, the brand ambassador. He's the godfather of New Orleans. <laughs> right. He's like the I, Chamber I, of Commerce. Right? Like that, that name. He would probably prefer that. I don't think he'd be mad. You want to be the mayor? Do you want to be the Godfather? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I I think me and you and Dan and and Ken need to get on and have some fun. I I think that would be an incredible time. I really did. Actually, so they just posted a video uh, yesterday of their talk with Sarah. So they did an interview with Sarah. I'm just going to say this: a little bit jealous. All right, fellas that that are watching, Dan is watching for sure. Maybe Cannon's watching. You never know. A little bit jealous that my sister got on the show. Before I got on the show, I'm just saying, not for nothing, right? So they actually interviewed her back uh, during Standing University in Springfield. Is when I, when we were doing one of the dinners, she had popped up into a room and uh, did an interview with them for a little bit, or she's on the show with them for a little bit. But they went they went digging for gold a little bit. They were asking some probing questions about Joe the fence expert. They're like, "Well, you guys getting fights and what?" Dan is the instigator of this one because a couple of times he's like, well, what, what don't we know about Joe? Like, what don't we know it, in a fun way? Right. But he's like, what, what doesn't he tell us that we should know about, you know? Um, and she told it, she told a, a pretty good story. Know, a lot of people don't know that Joe's a drifter and he's got a, a Mitsubishi <laughs> uh, car with a big spoiler <laughs> on the back and it's lowered and it's got orange wheels and orange paint. And- <laughs> He goes drifting everywhere in his town. So that now they know. Now they know if if you see an orange blur through one of those roundabouts, or pops up and you get out. <laughs> that would be funny. So funny you say the doors popping up. So I'm looking at. <laughs> so the so we're getting ready to go to California, San Diego, and most of these. So we're there for uh, four or five days. Most of the days we're just we're staying in a hotel right next to the convention center. You don't need a car. You Uber everywhere. But we do need to get up to L.A. to go see Brigandy. And that's probably a little far for an Uber. So we need her in a car. So I got on Turo, which Turo is like the Airbnb of automobiles, right? Mm-hmm. So you put your car up. I could rent your car if it was on there for the day or something. And we only need it for a day. And when you're only looking to rent a car for a day, you can get a little creative with your selections. I'm just saying there is a blade. Eh, it might not be blaze orange an orange McLaren for rent in San Diego. And now if I was renting this thing for multiple days out of the question, it's the price is a little steep, but for one day we might cruise around in a McLaren and it will be orange. Will you, like, be, that was, will you, will you be alone? Uh, no, no. So, um, Sarah will be with me. And then, uh, if you're around it will all tool around in this thing it uh yeah it could be it could be pretty interesting i sh- i showed taylor so what's <laughs> actually the first two people i showed were my insurance agent and taylor <laughs> so uh my <laughs> my agent had come by to bring the policy uh the work comp and journal liability policy i was like hey while i got you uh our policy includes rented and not owned automobiles right he's like yeah is there like a cap on that? Um, is, is there an upper limit? He's like, hmm, well, I got the policy right here. Let's flip. He's like, no. No, it replaces the actual cash value. <laughs> no kidding. All right, well, let me show you this just to make sure this applies. And he was, he's our age. He's like, dude, you got to. You got to do that. He's like, it, the policy <laughs> covers it. The policy strictly says actual cash value. Now, something happens in that thing. This policy changes next year. You can be sure of that. But yeah. Don't right now, but, and then, so Taylor saw it too. And so when I got home, Taylor's like, listen, you're not getting that car, right? I'm thinking they, about it. They were all sold out of F-150s, you know. That's what <laughs> was, yeah. Darn the luck. You know what I mean? Just darn the luck. Uh, so it reminded me of a friend of ours though, because they had a, they had a significant amount of Teslas available. Like Teslas are a real thing out there. I mean, not that they're not a real thing elsewhere, but there was probably like 15 or 20 available. Yeah. And there's some of them that were like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? So it's not chrome. It's like psychedelic color. Uh, Like depending on how, it's not chameleon either. Iridescent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Iridescent. Bingo. That's the word. 
So that's kind of interesting. But then I just typed in the search criteria, orange. And there's a few options. If if we don't want to go the uh, supercar with the McLaren, there's also a Lotus available. So that's kind of interesting. Um, what else? There's another orange vehicle available. But now I think it actually the thing is a Corvette. I was like, eh, it's a two seater, and I don't know. So anyway, could be an interesting and yeah, it's orange. So we'll do some video with it. Right, so we'll you know, include it in pictures, include it probably in a YouTube video. Yep, and then I'll need to consult my CPA to be sure. But I think that's a uh, marketing expense. Once we include that thing in a video, could you, be. you need you need some orange door magnets. <laughs> God, could you imagine on on a McLaren just come pulling up to Burgundy like hello? However, for those arc fans, you you must <laughs> like uh, our conversation just got a lot more expensive, actually. Yeah, but no, yeah, it's... Can you poke the machine before we get there. You know, <laughs> if you sell equipment, or can you? <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna need to lock a few of these conversations in before I come pulling up. Yeah. Um, there, like you, like so this, and I'm not affiliated with Turo in any way. There's some cool cars on there. Like you could rent a Bentley, you could a McLaren, obviously. Uh, there's some, there's a few Maseratis, there's some Ferraris. It's crazy, and and a ton of Porsche Boxsters. Like I don't know what that's about, but I bet there was eight to ten Porsche Boxsters available to rent. Who knew? I always like Porsches. Those are cool cars. They are. They really are. So, and, and one of the other stipulations was it needs to be a convertible. Because typically this time of year in San Diego, the weather's pretty nice. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So I figured a comment like this. This is the this is the comment. If we do get the uh, McLaren, this is the comment. Joe becoming the Ty Lopez of fencing. <laughs> now I'm yeah. not saying I'm going to sit in front of the car, and be like, all right. I I used to do fence, and now I've got this car, and I need to have like a what does he usually has a, you need a, a course. bookcase you need an online him. course. Well, that's 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 what I was gonna say. Now, for the low low price of ninety nine dollars a year for the rest of your life, I will teach you. You know, just whatever it is. I'll be a fence expert. <laughs> that, yeah. that here's the thing: is like people love to poke, poke fun at that guy, Ty Lopez, but he it's one of those things. Like, is what's that meme where he's drying up tears with hundred dollar bills? He's like, oh, I'm so sad. Like, you yeah. know, like he's doing it for a reason. Yeah. He tested it and it works and it's repeatable. Yeah. So now will Joe be in front of a, I think he does it with a Lamborghini maybe. Uh, or, or like six of them. He's all, you know, there'd be 10. It's been a long time since I've seen him, but he'd have 10 cars in a mansion. Yep. He'd have bikini supermodels running everywhere. It, yep. Yeah. He had he had uh, things pretty figured out as far as the market. It was all goes. rentals. It was all rentals. None well, of you it know it. Real. Yeah, every, yeah, you every know. Place. And and listen, I bet if you talk to him about it and you ask, him, he was like, "Yeah, for sure they were." Like, oh, yes, you, just, I, you could see the, the the rental tags on the keys in the videos. It was a big conspiracy <laughs> theory a while back. Yeah. Well, all it's like, sure. all right. So you see a family in a Mercedes for a Mercedes commercial. That family doesn't own that Mercedes either. You know what I mean? Like this is a commercial. He's shooting a commercial. Now he's counting on the fact that you you associate him with these luxury items, mm -hmm. and you too one day could have these luxury items. Fish and picking. That's not what we're going to do with the video. I can mm -hmm. guarantee you. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Christian says I already ordered you scaling up. You sir are a gentleman. I appreciate that. Let's see. Kobe Bacon, are you guys both going live together once a week now? If not, you guys should. Once a week might be a bit much. I do go live once a week, every Saturday. Nah, yeah. Pause, not every Saturday. I guess I should clarify because I've been off for a little bit. Um, we we can talk about this live. Um, 30 minutes every Tuesday or something would be cool. <laughs> Well, you know what we used to do, Caleb, and and I'd like to get back in the habit of it, is having you on like once a month, you know, like the last Saturday of the month or like whatever works. And it doesn't have to be the same Saturday every month. You know what I mean? Because you got a family and you've got obligations. Um, oh, yeah. But we ought to make this, 
I would like to make this a, a dedicated effort to have you on at least once a month. You know, it's I enjoy the conversations personally. I have fun, man. But but also I think there's value here too. You know, and and I'm probably not the best host of this thing because we haven't said one word about the rebranding. We probably should. Uh, but yeah, I gotta, but I say I that say we talk about all sorts of stuff. Yeah, Kobe actually is going to come down. He's from I believe Michigan. He's going to come down for four weeks and intern with us, and he will leave a stain and seal expert when he gets done. So he's going to work with some of our crews, and he's going to learn the trade. He's trying to start his own business up there. So what a commitment! Be- yeah, pretty. Like, we'll see. What an incredible commitment! We're Yo, all who still- is it? It's I think it's Gary Vaynerchuk that says something like that. Like if you want. If you want to be the best at something, go intern for the best in that industry for, you know, this Kobe might actually have referenced this exact thing because I think it is for you. So go intern for them and and see how they do it and then take it back and implement what you find from them. Uh, because, I mean, Caleb, you've already we were talking about, you know, business coaches kind of navigating you around pitfalls. You're basically going to do the same for him. Right. And your yeah. your team is too. So if they're talking about taping and masking, I bet Cody's gonna say, Hey, listen, here's a pitfall. Don't fall in it. Actually go this way, you know, or something like that. Um That'd Kobe, be cool. I commend you for that. The best way to do it, the best way to learn is to intern for the best in whatever you're trying to do. For sure. Mm-hmm. When we're talking about this new business. Uh, we're going to work probably me and a couple of my team that I we're we're kind of in the process now of figuring out who comes with me And it's not like I'm leaving, but who helps me with this new business. And then, uh, we're going to figure who, whoever those people are out first and then take them, uh, to do some on, on the job training for a couple of weeks. Um, just working with the company, just like what Kobe's doing, just work with a company that does this thing incredibly well. And, uh, I mean, it's the best education. Absolutely. So Kobe, well done. Zachary Griffin says, not sure if this is the right form for this. Any advice for the guys that don't have a yard and have to deal with the ever-changing prices from vendors? Quoting can be difficult. No, th- this is absolutely the right form for this question, Zachary. It really is. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you, so I think you made an assumption here. Any advice for the guys that don't have a yard and have to deal with the ever-changing? Like, you're struggling with that. The guys with yards are struggling with this too. Now we can mitigate it a little bit by having inventory, but so this happened yesterday. So we had to call kind of an emergency meeting, me and my dad and my sister, because the price of chain link fittings has absolutely gone through the roof. We ordered three weeks ago or something. So for example, a three inch bar arm, something we don't use a lot of, but we do, I say we don't use a lot of them. We're using 75 of them at the airport next week, but, uh, 260% 260% increase from three weeks ago. That I don't believe real. it, man. I got a pro- I got a major problem with some of these. There's there's no reason behind them. We 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 need I mean at, at some point it's like, come on, what right? Why does the egg cost twice as much as it used to cost? It's the, still the same chicken and the same, you know. Yeah, and and, uh, and the farmer gets paid the same. That's in this scenario, well, that's we, what that we is. Have, we have beef cattle. Yep. We still get the same price per pound for a beef we got three years ago that we got five years ago. But now hamburger, organic hamburger meats like 15 bucks a pound. Yeah. Or steaks. Check check out what steaks have done. Yeah. I see people with a picture of two steaks and it's 90 bucks or something. It's like, come yeah. on, man. What's the deal here? Right. What's going on? It. Oh. Yep. You know, and here's the thing is. So I had a conversation that's a lot like this on the yeah. channel and uh, with the with a manufacturer um, about, so the conversation was similar to this. It was talking about independent manufacturers, wholesalers, as a, as opposed to corporate wholesalers. And that was kind of, this is kind of where that conversation went. <coughs> and uh, that, well, I, I won't get into it because that he might've told me this in confidence, but it, that this conversation is going on a lot. You know what I mean? Is that it's like, well, the, the guys in the middle are the ones that are really taking advantage of this. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's crazy well, to think about because so some of these things, 
some of these fittings we buy direct from India. And I'll just, I think that's, con I think the, I'm not going to get into the U.S. versus foreign debate, but we buy some of these things from India. So I have the price list of what these yeah. things cost to produce. You know, right? yeah, the India story, this is a good debate because we're very, very pro-American, by american Yeah, yeah. Steel yeah. pails, $15 in America. I can get the same pail from India or from China or from Bangladesh or from Vietnam or from anywhere for a dollar. One dollar versus fifteen dollars. At what point do we have to bend and, and break on this? You know, so we've been yeah. looking at steel pails like, well, hey, what does it take for us to just buy the machine to make the steel pails? The amount of money we would save this year by buying, uh, making our own pails will pay for the machinery to have full printed pails. <laughs> Plus I called four other companies and they said, yeah, we'll buy our pails from you. So I'm going, oh my gosh, now I'm going to start a freaking metal pail manufacturer. I don't want to do that. Uh -huh. I do not well, want to do that, but will I do it? Absolutely. Yeah. And somebody's got to, some, somebody else can probably do this better than us, but we need more American manufacturers. It's not that yep. the big guys are evil. It's that we, no. the big guys can't keep up. If you can't keep up, we need, you know, we need more people. So here's why. So in our, in our instance, so a two and a half inch tension band from India, 41 cents. Plus there's about 30%. So there's about 30% shipping in there too, but let's just call it 41 cents. Well, or I mean, or we get crazy. We add in the, the 30%. So, you know, whatever, call it 60 cents, maybe. And then I think that's high, but we'll call it 60 cents each. That mm -hmm. it includes import fees and all the rest of it. This same thing, this same fitting, two and a half inch tension band from, and I, and we've gotten prices from a couple domestic because I think it's worth at least exploring. Yeah. Right. $3 to three fifty. Mm -hmm. So that's your discussion. Is it 60 cents or is it $3 and 50 cents? Well, here's, here's the test that I think everybody watching would like to see is let's, let's destroy some of them. Is the Indian one 300% weaker? What what happens if it's actually stronger or better? You know, is that's, I mean, I think that's interesting. That's that's a it was the same well, thing for us. We may we may buy a Chinese bucket or an Indian bucket and just get it over here and, and seal yeah. it up. Let's let's destroy. Let's buy ten of them. Let's destroy them. Let's <sighs> fill them with air. See how many psi it'll take. Let's drop them with with water in them. Let's do all these tests and let's see. How, because if the American guys will say, well, our product is so superior, we have to charge 15 bucks when you can get it delivered here for a dollar. Well, let's yeah. see, really, is that the case? If it is the case, let's uphold good quality. But sure, you know, but sometimes the quality is not always better. So I think it's important that people push for quality, push. We, hey, we want to, right. we want to make sure the quality is right. So, so, th so that's the I was just going to finish with we've we have heard directly from reps underneath big manufacturing companies, big lumber companies that, hey, you know, the prices really are down low. But our leadership has found out that you guys will pay a premium. So we're not going to lower the price. And in the word that they use from the reps of the very company that they represent is greed. This price is driven by greed. And uh, so I think. This may get us in, get me in some hot water, but man, I think some people are gonna, I think some people are gonna start saying, "Hey, you know, why don't we start our own lumber mill?" Or, "Hey, why don't we start our own, you know, fitting manufacturing thing?" Grandpa used to fit, make his own fittings. You know, there were so, so Ozark, many people. Ozark Fence was founded by my grandfather and his brother in law because his brother in law had a steel foundry, mm -hmm. and we can make our own fittings. So not for nothing, I, I think you're right. I think that conversation is happening right now about, you know, fence companies start manufacturing their own their own materials, if for nothing else, that to be independent or a little bit more independent. Now, well, Rio, I fully understand you, you bump that dependency up a level, right? Yeah. Like, so now you're not depending on the fitting, you're depending on the rod or whatever it is. Well, it's called free market. It's called free market, right? And so... So if there is some shenanigans going on, if that does exist, 
they'll have to get right about it. Hey, you know, the gig is up. We're going to have to get, we're going to have to get competitive on pricing here or they're going to go somewhere else or they're going to make it themselves. That's free market. That's what capitalism truly is. A lot of people say capitalism's broken right now. Well, you're fixing to see what capitalism really is because everywhere we go, there's new manufacturers coming out of the woodwork. Yep. It's everywhere. Well, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So we've got, I mean, we've got a container coming right now from India with a bunch of fittings on it. So I think it'd be pretty easy to to put one of these tests together. And actually, uh, so my sister Sarah runs a residential projects, residential division. Her husband is an engineer. Now uh, he deals with like electrical grid stuff, but he's got that mind, right? He has that engineer mind where I bet he and I could sit down and kind of devise some testing on what is it better? Like I would love to know. I think a twist test. So if you put a brace band through it, a twist test when it with it bolted to something, how much can we twist it before it breaks? And then maybe you could get like a you could bolt it through using an yep. American bolt and a Indian bolt, and you could put a hydraulic ram or a log splitter and, and just pull, pull see where it breaks. A couple of tests like that would be pretty interesting. I think so. I think so. And I don't think they would be terribly hard to uh, to put together. So, and, and here's the thing is we saw Sean do this with the with a pull test on the posts, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's a lot of guys that are starting to have this mentality of, well, I've been told it's this way, but I want to see if it's that way. Like, I just want to see it for myself. I want to test it and I want to document it. So that's what one thing he was doing was he was documenting, you know, how many pounds of pull like each one of these posts took to bring out of the ground. Um, I think we could do the same thing. How many pounds of pull does it take to break this thing apart? And then you there's know? the cycles test. You know, if something needs cycled, you can cycle it. We did the same thing when COVID started, our five-gallon buckets. We noticed the same bucket that we've always got. The price went way up on it, and the quality went down. So we we started doing tests, and we've actually got a ton of film of filling buckets and the bucket we use and then different buckets, filling it with water, dropping it from forklift, dropping it where it lands on the lid, dropping it where it lands at an angle. And we found one bucket. We could, we literally dropped it like five or six times from six feet up. And then we, it took a 20 foot drop to, to make this bucket leak from forklift really? size go 20 foot drop. And uh, well, there's the bucket we went with, you know, and the, the fact was it wasn't the most expensive bucket interesting yeah it's like usually a lot of times the most expensive that we find sometimes is is um you know price and quality maybe it's it's at least yep. worth testing right so so you and i and someone else had had that conversation at fence tech about it about an item um that it kind of had that problem it was priced lower than the perceived value yeah right and, and when someone sees that they think huh well, usually I pay more for really good stuff, and this seems less expensive, so maybe it's not as good. When you and I both know the product, the product is solid. It's a very good product, mm -hmm. but it's it's priced in a way that when you compare it to the market, you're like, mm, I don't know. It let seems. Me, cheap, let me show you know. an example where that is not true. Let me grab some. Sure. Let me just shout out real quick. What's up, Varo Fence? Watching the run through of Fence Tech on TV now. Thanks for posting that. You're very welcome. Actually, today's video is kind of a more in depth look. Uh, there's like a few interviews from Fence Tech. So keep an eye so, out for that. 145 Central, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, and let's see. B. All right. So here's the deal. We make stain, right? Let me find another sticky note. I want to cover up some brand names here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but basically, uh, you know, um, we make stain, right? So in, in our stain, we have a special oil. And I can't spell this morning. And our oil is expensive. Our, we, our oil is actually food grade mm -hmm. okay it is not a food oil but it is food grade and it's it has ratings that classify it for that it's expensive oil it's pure it's very nice and 
it works very well. It does the job we want it to do very well. Some of you have seen our penetration tests. I don't know if I've got a block of wood somewhere, but so how can we save money in our business? Um, well, let's look at some cheaper oils because our oil has gotten expensive. Sure. Um, and it's been a problem for us. And the amount of money we can save by swapping oils is quite significant. Like Lamborghini buying, <laughs> like you could buy a Lamborghini this year with what we would save. So, um, so it's important to me to like, hey, how can we save money to run sure. our business more effectively? So, um, so I know the oils that our competitors use because the suppliers will quickly tell you what it is. Yeah. Um, and so this is us. This is the oil we use. This is the oil. Another, this is another common oil in the fence staining business. And so is this one. And these two here are real, really big names, right? Okay. And the one we use, sorry, the screen's backwards. So we a really quick test. Wood is made of paper, right? Paper's made mm -hmm. of wood. So I want to show you, remember, on, I'm going to block my face. So just check this out. This oil did not do anything. Now here's, this is us, right? Ours is a smaller circle. And this one over sure. here is, is bigger. So the test is a certain amount of, uh, a certain amount of, uh, let's see, how did I do this? Okay, make sure I get this right. Look. Ours is still there. Competitors is gone, right? Man, this is so hard backwards. But if you go down, ours is still there. Competitors gone. So we went through, There's ours has just a little bit left. And that's it. So how many pages is that? Pages doesn't seem, it, it doesn't seem like, well, maybe that's the greatest test. But actually, we yeah. are. The percentage, when you look at the percentage of pre penetration, it is profound because brand A or brand B here, this oil, cheaper, this oil, cheaper. So I'm not going to skip quality there. Right. So, so, so is it worth me buying the cheaper bucket so that I can maintain the high quality oil if the bucket is just as good? You're yep. darn right. It is. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so. Let's see here. I'm going to count. So I got through two, sh one, one oil got through one sheet. The second oil got through two sheets. And then our oil was on number three, number four, and barely on number five. So that's three more sheets. So what is that? 300% more than, than one and 500% more than the other. Um, so yeah, sometimes the more expensive is better. So yeah. If, well, anybody heard, if anybody heard me say that cheaper, that American made more expensive is not as good. That's not what you heard. So no, no, no. Right. And and I think, I think basically what I, what we were talking about was sometimes there's a disconnect between price and quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's real. Cause this other product that you and I were talking about is a fantastic product. The quality is sound. The warranty is good. Mm-hmm. But at the price point, people just don't believe it's as good because it's less. Like, no, it's a fantastic quality. But but then, it, like I said, I, I really don't think people should correlate price to value. Like, it's just a lot of times it's not the case. Yeah. Uh, but so I didn't actually answer uh, Zach's question, I don't think. Um uh, I was just saying that, that this is a problem for whomever, you know, with a lot or without a lot. So um, how do you handle the ever-changing prices from vendors? Quoting can be difficult. So, I mean, typically, so we're saying we'll hold prices for five days. Like the, the prices are good for five days. And I mean, it, I think that's really where you have to be at. Now, you know, I don't think you could say the prices are good for today. Right. When actually that's kind of what we're talking about. But the, I think the reason is that sounds like a sales trick. Right. It's I mean, it, it's like. Now, listen, a friend of mine is a car dealer, so I'm not saying about this, I'm not saying this about all car, car dealers, but it used to be, you know, one of those sales tricks was, well, this is the price while you're on the lot. You know, once you leave the lot, I can't guarantee the price. You got to make a decision now so I can get you in this car. Right. 
And so saying the price is only good for today while I'm here sounds a little bit like the same thing. It does. So yeah. I, I don't think you could say that. But, I mean, I think you could also argue that five days is gracious plenty to hold prices right now because they're, they're yeah. the prices are changing rapidly. Well, I was talking to my dad last night about this thing. Me and him had a phone conversation, and he was like, man, bidding right now. He's a spreadsheet guy and always has been. And uh, he uses Job Nimbus, but he calculates all of his pricing on old spreadsheets that he built years ago. And he said, those are just guidelines nowadays. He said, literally, yeah. the price has changed so much. And he's dependent on suppliers. Um, he does not manufacture or bring in truckloads. Um, and so that's a, like I could hear it in his voice. It's a struggle. It's it basically it went from, all right, we'll redo our pricing every 30 days or every 15 days to literally every bid. We have to sit down and figure every detail out by hand to make sure we're not uh, burying ourselves, you know, in a hole. Right. Right. It's a well, point for folks. It, it, it is. And so and one way you can help mitigate that is so we talk a lot about gross profit margin. A lot, the industry standards like 30 to 35%. Mm -hmm. We operate at 50% because we build in ourselves in a little cushion there too. Yeah. So we guarantee it for five days. What happens if the price raises in three? We still yeah. honor that price. You have so if yeah, the customer have comes on the fifth day and says, I will take it, honor it, which we said we were going to. Yeah. But Here's by building story. in that extra cushion. So Michael Taylor's listening, he'll know. So we buy a lot of raw materials and we've been, we get price letters literally every week of an increase of raw materials. Every single week it's going up before there were shortages of things and it would be hard to get. There'd be lag times on them or whatever. So I got another price increase notice and I was like, well, Hey, what if we just, um, we'll go ahead. Like, what do you got in stock right now? So we can buy it before the price increase. And they were like, Oh, well, we've got a gazillion, like we have way more than you and 10 of your best friends could ever use. Uh -huh. and I was like, how does that make sense? And that, so it's like, wait a minute, you know, yeah. when well, there's two just... of them left, I understand there's two truckloads uh -huh. left and somebody's good. There's 750 truckloads of fence post, but there's a shortage on them. And, and uh, you know, it's like, wait a minute. Is this, so, this, so this happened yeah. to us on fittings. So this happened yesterday. So we're talking about fittings. One of the one of the items we're talking about is two and a half inch brace bands. Well, we found, and actually, it was an online wholesaler um, had price that was significantly lower than the bids we got in. So it's like, let's see how many we can buy. Caleb, we bought ten thousand of them, and they were just in stock, ready to go. Now, ten thousand one hundred out of stock. It's like, all right, so ten thousand is it? But that's that's the exact same story. Like they. They had them available. They just wanted to charge a little bit more for them. I, you know, so as, as a manufacturer, you'll understand this conversation too. So we're, we do retail wholesale. That's why we brought 10,000 of those things in is because we'll probably sell them to some people, but, and we'll use them too. But so the conversation is the immediate conversation was, well, do we raise our prices? Right. If, if the, co the if the replacement yeah, cost goes up, Lost, yeah. So that's conversation. And my point was, no, we don't. We base our price based what, on what we paid for the things. Because that's, we don't like it when it gets done to us, yeah. right? That That is this exact conversation, is with the brace bands, with the buckets. It's like, oh, so you have a ton of them. You're just charging me more for it. Well, the, I'm the not going to turn around to do that. But the problem is, though, and here's the dilemma. Here's the dichotomy is you paid 50 cents a piece for these. You sell them for 57 cents. Yep. When you sell completely out to replace them, it costs you 64 cents. When, 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 when we sell things, we do it for a profit so that we can reinvest back in to, to buy yep. the next thing. Right. It's like if, if you buy a car, a lot of guys flip cars or flip sure. couches or they'll flip motorcycles or whatever. You can't, you know what I'm saying? It's like, well, you have to base the car market. You wouldn't sell your truck for what it's truly worth $10,000 when all the other ones are selling on the market for 30 because you got to replace it. 
And that's yeah. the problem we're running into in America. Is that no? Nope, I think most people they don't want it. Like my truck, I've got a, a, a Ford diesel truck. It's gone up like fifteen thousand dollars in value over the last two years. It's not really worth that much money, right? But would I sell right. it for less when I got to go replace it? You know, so it's like, dang, I I know it's well, silly. So it's kind of like a big game that we're playing. So, so here was kind of the end result of our conversation. So we, we use, who was I talking? I was talking to somebody about this. Oh, I was talking to Jacob Scalhorn about this, about blended cost. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so we know what our blended meaning, if we bought a thousand at 50 cents and a thousand at 60 cents, now all of a sudden our blended cost is 55 cents, right? Just the it. average of the two numbers. So that's what we're selling them at. I'm, I'm not, if the market is 75 cents, I guess we're going to sell a bunch of them because, you know, we're going to use our blended cost of 55 cents. Now we also set repurchase or rebuy limits, right? So when we sell through half the stock, we resupply mm -hmm. and that resets the pricing to a new blended cost. Right. I like, that's, I like the way you're doing that. I like So that. that's, that's kind of how I, that's, that's the way that makes me feel the best about it is yeah. it reflects our current cost of the thing. The well, you just said something there, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think that's that gets us through the the mind game of oh my gosh, how am I going to replace this? If you if you reorder at the fifty percent mark and use a blended cost, I like that. You probably learned that from somebody. I did. I like it. You did. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say it. Jacob Scalhorn and I had a conversation about blended cost in New Orleans, and that's and I had done stuff similar in the past, but I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, he and I, and, and it was funny. So it's that whole saying, like, there's, there's no more original thoughts, right? Like it's just yeah. repeating. He was, he was repeating a conversation to me that he had had with someone else about blended costs. I was like, he goes, have you ever, have you heard this? Like you should, we should talk about this. And I thought about it, like, we should talk about this. I think that's the that's, way, that's right important. way to value. So that's what we're doing because I don't want to be the guy, you know, if I paid 50 cents, you know, and, and the new cost is 75 cents. And so I sell it for whatever, 90 cents. I'm not going to feel super awesome about buying it for 50 and selling it for 90, right? Like, I'm not going to feel good about that. But I feel better about selling it at my blended cost because I think that's a true representation of what the things are valued at. And yeah. when, it, when I rebuy, the price is probably going to go up. That's so Candace in our office, she was making those phone calls all day yesterday to our clients saying, hey, our price is fine right now, but when we rebuy, the price is going to go up. So if you need something, if you know you have projects coming down the pipeline, now's probably the right time. You know, I mean, we'd still love to sell them to you in two weeks, but when the resupply comes, the cost is going up. Now, the interesting thing is the, the when India gets here, which is probably three months from now, uh, that blended cost is going to go back down. So that'll be, that'll be pretty interesting. I'd like to see what that looks like, but yeah. we're going to play it both ways. So, because here's the thing too, like I'm a consumer of things. Fuel is a big subject right now. I filled up for $3 and 80 cents a gallon, uh, a week and a half ago. It is $4 and 30 cents a gallon today for diesel. Mm -hmm. So, in talking about fuel, fuel goes up immediately. Like when, when news now, this isn't a political show. I'm not going to make political statements, but there's zero reason for fuel to be going up right now. Production costs haven't increased. We're largely neutral on petroleum products right now. So anyway, there's no reason for it, but the market price is up. So the price of fuel goes up. Now, Caleb, when the price of fuel comes down, what happens to the retail price? Does it come right down with the wholesale price? Yeah. Tell me about no. it. No, it feathers out for like two months to where it slowly brings it. It'll go up in a second and down over the next two months. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens to our market when, uh, so we'll drop the, I mean, we, we base it on blended cost as it comes in. So we're not going to feather the price down either. We're just going to drop the price. It is what it is. And we're going to send out an email blast. Hey, guess what? These widgets now cost 20% less. Take advantage of it now. Wall yeah. supplies last sort of thing. 
You know, if you look at the West Texas index, which is what I'm looking at right now, which is crude oil prices uh, or the West Texas intermediate, whatever. Um, 2017, we're looking at 50 and a quarter per barrel. Um, 2018, we're looking at 67.81 a barrel. Um, 2019, May, we're looking at $62 a barrel of crude oil. Something happened. Uh, I know what happened. Um, April 2020, uh, we're $36 a barrel. So when the market bottomed out because Saudi Arabia taught us old Yankees a lesson about pumping oil and mm -hmm. flooded the market. But now we're sitting at right down today, we're sitting at $96.13 per barrel. Um, and I've heard when it hits 96.15, there's going to be another increase. So well, that's, that's the thing is I shared this graphic yesterday on my, I think it was on my personal Facebook page, but the, so, so for fuel, I watched just the, the retail or the wholesale price of gasoline, our BOB is the ticker. So as now this was yesterday at 324 PM, the wholesale price of gasoline, just regular unleaded was 351. Mm -hmm. And my, my point was, Hey, if you need to go get fuel, go get it now. Cause it was still. The retail price was still 320, 323 here. I wonder, let me look up real quick. So I use this app called Gas Buddy, not sponsored or anything, to watch what the price of fuel is. And it's like almost real time. So let's see. Gas is still well, okay. So there's still a few places selling it for 329, more 349, uh, 359. So it still hasn't gone up. Like people are still selling fuel for less than the wholesale price right now because they still have they still have fuel in their tanks. You let those tanks get refilled and see what happens to the price of fuel. Like I said, if, if wholesale is 351, you're gonna have to mark that up some, right? At you know, so I don't think fuel at 375 is that crazy right now. We'll yeah, see. it's we'll it's see. a crazy time, man. Which means Let's bring this back around to fence and stain talk, which means we're going to talk about fuel surcharges again. Yeah. We've been here before, though. We can get through it again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the solution is you just tack on fuel surcharges to cover the increased cost. You know, yeah. I mean, that's what you have to do. When you pay 60, 80 cents more a gallon for fuel, you got to tack that on. All right. Let's catch back up. So a little off topic here. Brent says last week... A lady got bit by a great white on the boat we were lobster diving on. He's going to send me the pics. I, that'll be something. Also, the Sandy University was awesome. I agree. Okay, then Fish and Pickin made the comment about Ty Lopez. Apparently, you can rent Ty Lopez's book collection as well. Nice. So, there you go. This is this is in uh, reaction to Kobe coming down in, and uh, interning with you guys. Uh, doing what it takes. Absolutely agree. Let's see. So Michael says, yeah, you got to you got to check weekly now. I tell you, so uh, of the items we don't inventory, we check every bid. Like we'll get yeah. a current price. You got to rebid it, yeah. Right then. Now the customers don't love it because that means we don't do pricing on the, you know, on the spot. We don't go out for pricing anymore, but usually we would give a proposal right at the end of that phone call. Right, we'd send it while we're chatting so that they could pull it up and ans answer any questions they have while we're on the phone. Well, we can't do that anymore. It, it on non-stock items, we still can on wood and chain link. But if we're talking about ornamental, uh, so we still have some ornamental aluminum stock. But if you want to talk about ornamental steel, we're, we're going to have to price it. You know, yeah. And, yeah. and right now, pricing from vendors takes two to three days. Like it, that's a whole crazy thing in by itself. But no, I th that's the thing is you have to check incredibly, incredibly so, regularly. Yeah, so it's almost like what's going to happen is it's you're almost it's almost to the point where fencing materials needs to be on its own stock market. You know, all the suppliers and you watch it go up and down all through the day and then you 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 lock in right there on the on the point. It's almost getting that to that point. So I hope I sure hope not. So that's kind of what we're what we're looking at. And, and here's an interesting conversation. So that that's interesting to think about. So you and I were talking about like conversations that are going to go on at social media marketing world. And one of them is like metaverse and web three and all that. 
but there's also a conversation about blockchain and how to apply blockchain type technology to different industries. So I think what you're talking about, so tickers, so, so ticker would be tough because tickers are for commodities. So you can follow the ticker for like bulk, like lumber LBR. You know, we walk, we watch that one for the price of what we think is going to do their price of pickets. But blockchain, one of the one of the key components or the key features is transparency and visibility. So what if all of all of these pricing structures were on the blockchain to where you could plug in an API and get real time calls for a two and a half inch tension band? Right. And you set up you set up an alert that when that thing goes up by X percent, you get a notification. So rather than having to bid every single project, you just have real-time access to that pricing information. Yeah, and it, and it ties right into your pricing structure where you're where that way when you've got 20 salesmen, they can go out and do their job instead of um, yep. worrying about this other stuff. Of real- said, well, and, and it benefits the wholesalers too. I mean, they don't like having to do you know, rebids every five days for us on 15, 20 projects. Like that's well, not it, fun. If it could be tied into job nimbus or whatever, that when yeah. you quote the job, it's there's a time stamp. It's good for five days. The time stamps yeah. right here. The supplier's connected to it. The supplier will honor it for five days, and that is it. Yeah, and and I think they will benefit from it because now they're not tying up their inside sales reps redoing quotes constantly. It'll be automatic. Mm-hmm. I think we're on something, bud. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's Need to figure out what this looks like, but I mean, it's you know, in in. All right, so take it up a level, right? So the manufacturer is going to say, well, what? So we have somebody inputting our price all the time. Like all of our branches have different prices. No, I, I think you, I think your input costs are on the blockchain. Now they're not going to enjoy that because it'll, one, one thing people don't, the people on the other side of the transaction don't like blockchain because of the visibility. Like you see everything. Like you see what all the costs were. So you're going to see their markup, Right. And they're not going to enjoy that. And that's why they probably won't want to do it. But if you tell them, say, hey, put your input costs in here. And then it will automatically, you know, okay, so think about it. So this, when you get the invoice or the bill of lading or whatever, and you input that into your system, now it automatically triggers repricing automatically all the way down the line. Right? I think that's possible. Yeah, we've been doing it with spreadsheets for years. It's just uh-huh. how do we how do we connect your how does your sheet connect to my sheet to the customer sheet to the supplier to the raw material and connect everyone. Um, right. Yeah. I think I think blockchain could be uh, could be a pretty powerful part of that. You're seeing it in transportation already. So you know, like nationwide carriers like FedEx and UPS and all them are playing with this to automate their tracking. So right now they'll issue you a tracking number. You have to go on to their website and track it and all this. So what they're looking at doing is investing in blockchain so that you get real time by the minute updates for every parcel you have out there. Right. So, and it's all transparent so they can see, you know, so, okay. So talk about staying. So me as a consumer, I could see real time label created label scan this is stuff you can see on their website but you would see it automatically just in the blockchain scan on the truck from the truck to the terminal from the terminal to another truck on that truck in route to springfield offload springfield offload on delivery truck out for delivery so yeah. that's what they're looking at for block i mean there's there's large companies investing in blockchain i guess is what i'm saying as a better way of doing what they already do so i think we could <sighs> It would be a mass. It would be a massive commitment. Like I, I'm sitting here, like thinking about like the logistics of what it would be like, and you have to get the manufacturers on board, which I think you lose them all when you say, "Hey, you have to put your input costs in here," you know, because they're gonna say, "Well, I don't want to." You know, why am I telling yeah, the world what? Yeah, but somebody's gonna. Somebody will do it. And so, so the question is, is hey, if you're a nerd and you're watching this right now, call us and and um, we've got some ideas to us. Yeah, let's talk about it because. Um, that might be a way we could help the world is by coming up with something like that. I mean, so that's the thing, that- right? I, I think the benefit, I think the reason a manufacturer, the first manufacturer would get on board is because there is that transparency. 
because they're well, like, listen, it's going to lower, it would, it's gonna lower their inputs. If you needed well, 17 inside salesmen before, now we right, need right. three. Yeah, their overhead's uh, going to come down drastically. Overhead will come down. So I don't and know. How many... I'm, I'm kind of interested in experimenting with that. If we could get somebody to help us, I would I would do that thing. I like this. I like this a lot. My my free time for the next three years just went out the window. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, 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 no. Let's find somebody, a professional. Right, right. Well, a professional, remember? Yeah, we need to hand this iron. Okay, we're doing the. We're gonna call this the Warner method. We're gonna take an iron. We're gonna find someone to hand this iron to, and we're gonna sit and soak the fire. So, if you are a nerd, and and I mean that so politely because a lot of people in, call themselves nerds with a massive you're, amount you're, of respect. Yeah, absolutely. if you're into this kind of thing, maybe maybe we're totally wrong here or off base, or this is impossible. Yeah. But Come educate us. I would love to have a round table with somebody that really knows this kind of thing and uh, talk with me like Michael Taylor. He, he understands all of this. He's a number. He was a logistics coordinator for, uh, or an, a logistics analyst yep. for Nissan. And his job was to know to the third of a penny, every, every piece that it took to make a car, what it cost for that piece delivered to every facility in North America that Nissan had. So every nut, every bolt, every fender, every wheel, what it cost at that location, because it's different, right? And uh, so these things exist. How can we link them? So if you're a nerd and you know how to do that, give us a call. So here, here's, you and I are going to have this conversation with a gentleman named Michael Stelzner in California. When we're at social, he puts on social media marketing world. He, he has social media examiner, but the reason we're going to talk to him, he just started a podcast on crypto metaverse, that sort of thing. So he won't, he probably won't be the one to talk about it, but he will know the person that we need to talk to about it. That's exactly. Yeah. I don't, we, I don't know that, that I could be, or you could be the the person to take this into the world, but if we can show interest and spark somebody that could yes. do this um, right. it could help because we've spent the last two years not running our business like we used to we've spent the last two years running um dealing with price increases dealing with shortages and dealing with new rules and laws and emotional things with people because you don't want to come to somebody's backyard without a mask or whatever and for, we've been right. dealing with all of those things Remember the good old days when we just ran our business, <laughs> right? No kidding. It's like no a bit kidding. different than it used to be. So if it we is. can do one thing to help people um, get a little bit back to, to take that burden off of a cup, you know, someone, cause I'm telling you, man, my dad called me the other day. It was a major, like, he was like, dang, this is, it's taken a lot of, it's added a lot of stress and, uh, to his life and it's took away a lot of his personal time because bidding these jobs constantly. Yeah. So if you could automate that, that would be tremendous because what you would do on, on the service side is the same thing we're saying the manufacturers would do. You would just create an algorithm that says, take this number, multiply it. Well, Sean King would argue that you divide, you don't multiply. Okay. You put on your markup onto this thing and it automatically and then you say we are at this much per panel for labor or what however you want to figure labor mm -hmm. so yeah and then it would just automatically real time so this it wouldn't even be daily pricing this would be by the minute prior fractional second pricing as soon as the manufacturer gets in a new brace band that costs 15 percent more did it, did it, did it, did it, it flutters all the way down the line and your price gets updated a fraction of a second later just because technology so. I, I, think, I speed. think eventually it could get to that up to the second you know a thousand times a second that the price updates but i think to start most suppliers are changing their prices weekly now aren't they yeah so but, but what i mean is they swap their system boom yours could be updated on an every five day rotation which would be better than it is now yeah Agreed. Agreed. But but the thing is, if you could get them to, if you could get them to enter it as they receive the goods, I mean, they're not receiving goods once a week. They're receiving it several times a day. Yeah. Right. So if you could get them to input their cost and 
then it would just it would update automatically. So yeah, take this up a level further. If you could, what if you what what if you partnered with the manufacturers, and then it just then that that may, for the manufacturer or for the wholesalers. Yes. Yeah, so retailers, now we're talking. So we're thinking too small though. Now we're talking about um, a software, an integration platform that takes um, that basically an in between. We make the in between the the raw material supplier manufacturer to the supplier to the wholesaler to the fence company we and that could be any industry so we make it we we make um you know we make the we're the hands that are outstretched on both sides to connect we're yeah. the connector um yeah and so yeah. if we could do that i think it would help a lot of people how much burden would that take off the wholesaler if the manufacturer was involved in this and the wholesaler just accepted the price and then it automatically updated all the way down the line, they don't have yeah, to do price we're, updates. We're anymore. doing this anyways. All we're doing is just, you're, you're basically just, um, given people are already doing this. As soon as yeah. we get a price increase, you better believe we're going, Oh gosh. And we put it in Michael Taylor's little computers over there making all kind of crazy noise. And, I'm going, what's going on? I go, we must've had another price increase. And, um, so yeah, I mean, people we're already keeping track of these things as we get them. So how yeah. can we just make it where it, you see it instantly? So I think it comes yeah. down to good, a good system that could work on any website as a customer portal. And maybe it's a Zapier thing. You zap it over mm -hmm. to people's job Nimbus to yeah. their, whatever the other program programs people use. Um, how do that's Link that's those. the thing is so the dream we're talking about is as the manufacturer says hey my widget now costs 10 percent more to manufacture within a within a moment it affects my pricing it doesn't take this time to trickle down right so what some of the manufacturers what some of the wholesalers are saying about these fittings increases are like well my landed cost just went up i had no idea until this thing got to me that it costs this much more, which I don't fully believe that story either, but maybe, I don't know. But then that took some time to trickle down to me because I'm not, so this, I'm not buying these things every day, right? We buy them every few weeks. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's taking time to trickle down. You know, the, the manufacturer may have raised their price a month ago, but it took time to trickle down to get to me. Whereas, you know, this dream we're talking about would be, I mean, near instant. I mean, the way the way data travels now, the speed of data is. Here's, a, here's another crazy idea. What if there was a place, a marketplace for that huge, that truckload of pipe I bought last year that I'm never going to use the job backed out. It's sitting on my lot. I'd like to move it at a, at a wholesale price, get it off my lot, get it off my books and to put some cash in my pocket. And if you take 10,000 contractors who've got that, why don't yeah. we make a marketplace, a free marketplace um, where fence guys could come in and trade their stuff where stain guys could yeah. come in where window people imagine being in the window and door industry. You know, we used to have 5,000 aluminum fence panels sitting out back. Imagine like the door guys, they got like 700 interior doors that have just piled up over the years. And is there a place for that? Well, I, yeah. So what I'm, yes, I think so. Because so when we were, we were trying to source some uh, black coated chain link wire a while ago, and we were talking to one of the wholesaler manufacturers and they said, you know, we don't have any right now. But I know a guy that I sold 10 truckloads to three months ago. I know he's got some in his warehouse. Let me call him yeah. and see if I can't buy back some and sell it to you. So what you're talking about just cuts that middleman all out. Like this guy. Well, I, I bought truckloads of, of um, when the big crunch happened. I, I bought truckloads of, of cedar to pre-stain mm -hmm. from a guy in Chicago. Yeah. He he would he got it from where I wanted to get it from. And he said, you know, I've got I got a bunch here in my warehouse. We'll sell it to you. And um I got a good price. He got a good price. Everybody was happy. Yeah. As a company, I don't care who I sell my things to. Right. Even even if I'm only a server, even if we don't do retail wholesale, even if I'm only a service okay. provider, 
I don't care who I sell my thing to. Well, right? think whether my thing's a picket or a two by four or a race band, it doesn't. It doesn't well, matter to my business who buys this thing. So my dad had a told. he had a 2017 F two fifty diesel beautiful truck, and he wanted to sell it. So he sold the truck back to the dealer. Mm -hmm. They reached out to him and were like, "Hey, we want to we want to buy your truck," and um, they paid him a price for it, which he was so happy to get. They turned around, like it was a two year old truck, three year old truck. They gave him like fifty grand for it. They turned around and sold it for like seventy two. Yeah. yeah, why didn't my dad sell it for sixty eight? Yep. So this is that same conversation. It's like like it's like the thing you see on the the window stickers of the Ford Bronco. It's like thirty five thousand dollars market adjustment price ninety four thousand dollars. <laughs> uh -huh. like at some point, wh when are people going to say, you know, we're not going to fall, we're not going for this anymore? So it may be time. Maybe somebody does have a little Craigslist for fence supplies. Maybe a Craigslist for you know generators well, I, or whatever. You know no, that's what we're talking about, though. That's what we're talking about, blockchain. Mm -hmm. right? so there's a blockchain market for this that says the price of, you just set the price you want to sell your thing for. Whether you're the manufacturer, the wholesaler, retailer, end user, you have access to this thing to say, hey, I have, so, it, so what we're talking about is a digital version of the stock market. I can sell stock just like anybody else can, I put an offer out into the market that says I have 10 of these stocks. I'm willing to sell it for this price. Who wants to buy it? Right. And I'm on the same market as everyone, all these other investors. Right. That's what we're talking about. Well, and, and Joe says, I need fittings. So when fittings become available, I want them. And this is the price I'll pay for them. Boom. Joe's got them. Yeah. Wow. And then, and then somebody else says, Hey, I got those things. And I agree with that price. You and I just come to a price and you send them to me. Interesting. You know, you know yeah. what I mean? Like this, all this thing happened digitally. Like with digital contracts now, that's a whole thing. Like oh, there's so much of this conversation. So, but I, we need to, and I, and I, I think that I know the people that can make this conversation happen. We need to have this conversation with Michael Stelzner. Mm -hmm. um, I, the guy that got me into YouTube knows Michael personally. So I'm sure I know this guy's going to be there. So we'll just ask him like, Hey, could you get me five minutes with Stelzner at any, like I will make myself available whenever he's available. And because we want to talk to him about this idea, see who he knows that we should talk to, uh, knowing that he's not the guy, but he knows the guy yeah. or, or the like whatever. Um, yeah. We need to make that happen. I That's agree. interesting. Or, or, yeah, somebody needs to. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, it might as well be us. I mean, it's, we have experience. You have experience on the manufacturer side, right? Talking about raw input costs, things like that. I have a little bit of I have experience on the on the end user for the last 55 years. Or, no, it's more than that. Since 1950. Anyway, a lot of years. Um, and we're getting into retail wholesale. Like, I'm, we're not talking about any of these national supplier levels, obviously. But we sell... You know, we sell five, six hundred thousand a year in retail. So, like, we sell a decent well, amount. Here's what we're getting to here, Joe. I just clicked to my head. Remember, in the old days, why do fence builders need to be friends? Because you can get on the phone and you can say, Mark, dude, we're in the middle of this commercial job. I've got to finish it by Monday. I'm short a four inch schedule 80 post and yep. three, three inch line post. Do you have you got them? Yeah, man. I've, I've got them right behind my shop. Let me go. Out. Yep, I've got them. I'm looking at them. You want me to just send Bill over there and drop them off to you, dude? If you do that, I, man, it'd mean the world to me. No problem. That's what we're doing. But yep. instead of on a local level, we could take that to a national level, and that could be for all trades. You know, Absolutely. think about painters. Hey, we just finished a job with, with, um, you know, agreeable gray Sherwin Williams. <laughs> we painted the hotel that we have, we have 22 cans of it left over yeah they're gonna go in my warehouse you you in boise idaho you just sold a job and you need you need 18 mm -hmm. how about i just sell you the 22 for the price of the 18 we both win yeah win win um, minus the freight cost so that's a sure. cool that's a cool concept that that is an old school concept it's just how do we do it on a bigger grander scale and yeah um, 
I think it's a modern of- version of that established yeah. concept. Yes. I love it. This is why we need to have these conversations regularly so that we come up with great ideas like this. Uh, let's see. Um, all right. So I'm going to, we'll talk about the first part of this question. When trying to sell a complete restoration on a six foot cedar privacy fence, I like to give them an approximate replacement cost to compare it to. What is a fair average replacement cost? There, there isn't an answer to this question, mm-hmm. right? Because so, you know, so I had Sean King on it months ago, but he and I had this exact conversation that him and I's businesses say they say we do the exact amount of revenue each year, exact same amount of revenue, exact same amount of team members. We were next door to each other in the exact same building. We're going to have two different prices mm-hmm. because I mean, our business goals could be different. Our investment strategies could be different. Our pr- There's so much different in this that we couldn't, we would have different prices. And we're talking about the same town next door, same people, like, much less people that are across town with a different size building with different amount of employees, different age of equipment. Like the price is always going to be different. The sooner we can get away from market price, the better because market price ends up biting a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. But I think he's probably right on the money down on the second part of the question is what is a fair replacement cost? Who knows? But you could, I mean this, and this is a conversation you have with local companies. If you've got a relationship, If I'm your stain guy, say, Joe, um, what what is it like? This is a conversation over coffee, right? For yeah. you, I stain all your fences. How much is a new fence cost these days? Yeah, it, so, and and let me. So we we bid projects per project, right? We don't bid by the foot because again, that's dangerous. But we do have programs such as my salesman that require a perfect price, right? And that's fine. So what we'll do is we'll pull up the last three projects. We'll average out the price per foot. We'll put it in there because there's a margin. There's a margin you deal with in that anyway. You could probably do the same thing. So, hey, for your last three projects, what do you think the average was? You know, is it, and and, and you could throw out the numbers. You know, you say, hey, is it between 30 and 50 a foot? Am I high or am I low or where am I in this? You know what I mean? But I mean, it's going to depend on materials. It's going to depend, it depends on so much. 30 to 50. Um, you know, if we're talking about a wood fence, um, 50, 50 is low for some of our offerings, but it's high for others, you know, uh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah and well, I don't want to get in too far so, into pricing. So, details, um, but, so what you, you know. can, here's the, here's a really good way to figure this out is if you stain fences for a living and 80% of them are new fences, Hey, Miss Jones, by the way, what did you pay for this? Yeah. fence? Or most of the time they send us the paperwork anyway, we can see it. You know, mm-hmm. here's your receipt. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you could, and so you could start building some of that knowledge base up. Um, sure. I'm a fence guy, so I'm going to be like, well, is it this? Is the gate included? Is the gate not included in the foot? Right. But for you, it's like, hey, they paid 3200 bucks for a 122 foot fence. Divide it. Divide it you up. Know, there you go. And I think yeah. that would be a good thing. So it would get I, you I, close. Yeah. Uh, fish and picking says my wife is an optometrist. She tries to offer her patients the best frame and lenses for cost, but 90% of her patients only care about the brand name frames that are crappy and break easy. So this is talking about the, the price to value, you know, relationship. So what it sounds like what he's saying is that the name brand ones are crap and, but their name brand, it's kind of like Gary V's talk about the Nike. He said, this is the same shoe everywhere, but it has a swoosh on it. It's still made in a, in a, Mm-hmm. you know same factory same place. well so um i had this conversation it might have been you and i talking about uh a particular kind of bourbon that is sold at costco under the kirkland's brand mm-hmm. same thing it, it, it oh, is yeah. and it's the it's also the great value concept and all that right it's same stuff same we did <laughs> so we did work at a place that makes condensed milk and it was literally the lines were next to each other. Great value label, brand label, same factory, same input, same everything, different names. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Yep. Yeah, but so I, 
but people do attribute. So those two things are exactly the same. There will be people that buy brand name because they feel like it's more of a value than the white label, yeah. than the great yeah. value. When it's the same exact, literally same exact stuff. Nathan, man, Nathan, I'm not even going to try your last name. I would butcher it. I apologize. Or, and it's not even Nathan. It's Nathaniel. I First day back here, folks. Uh, how does software like Jobber and Company Cam help the business? I'm looking about getting them. I'm not familiar with Jobber. I know a lot of guys use it. Uh, a lot of guys like it. So I'm not going to say one thing or the other about it. Now, Company Cam we use. Uh, we like using Company Cam because we can all view pictures real time. You know, so... We could be, you know, we we work in our local area, but we could be a national brand and it uploads pictures in real time. So for us, if if one of our guys, I don't know, has a question about a layout or maybe a utility marking or a sprinkler head, he can snap a picture of it in company cam and then call me and say, hey, I need you to look at this picture and let me know what you think. I can pull it up. I guess in this instance, I have two devices. I don't know. But I can look it up and say, yep, I see it. Okay. What well, we're talking about is this, this, and this. I could then, or we could, we could conference call in with Sarah or whatever. Real time access to, to photos. It cuts down the speed of communication for us. Yeah. Truth Seeker says, I have company cam and love it. Makes documenting each job so easy. Absolutely. It also has a great before and after photo overlay. Uh, so it makes yeah. taking before and after photos simple. I mean, it's, even I can do it well. The man, the myth, Al Martins. Yes, sir. Talking about an intelligent person, hey, Al might be getting a kick out of this conversation. Al might be able to help us. He's kind of in this world with the speed of light and transfer of information. So, But having said that, man, Joe, I told you 30 minutes today. <laughs> in two and a half hours. Brother, yeah. I've got to go. It is a You've family got it. day for me, and I'm going to go four kids, and I'm going to spread a lot of joy. Taking them to do see it. Grandpa, and grandpa and do some fun stuff today. You so, got it. Thank I've you so much for coming on, Caleb. I really yeah, do appreciate it. Guys, check us out at staininguniversity.com. We're going to keep doing these things, Joe. So I appreciate you being a part of it. And um, we're working on that name change because so a challenge I'd like to put out to everybody, and maybe you can talk about this later, is this is more than Staining University. It is more than that. We need a name. Sure. We need a name. Um, that, like, that is kind of all encompassing. Yeah, all encompassing of what we do. Um, so throw some ideas around. Maybe you guys will come up with something. And uh, with having said that, I got to roll, man. Appreciate you your time. It. Thank you so much. All right, man. We'll see you. See you, bud. All right. Well, first and foremost, again, thanks to Caleb for coming on the show. I mean, he's always so giving of his time. Um, hello, Al. I appreciate you joining in. I hope that you're still here and talking about whatever this, you know, blockchain thing turns into. I think. The way your mind works, I think it could work out pretty well. I think you would have a pretty good insight into what we're talking about. Talking about fuel, Michael Taylor says three seventy nine for unleaded and four seventy nine for diesel. Yeah, it's it's getting really nutty right now. Nathaniel says I've heard it saved a lot of contractors' butts in regards to jobber and company cam. Again, I don't know about jobber company cam. I agree. So it's, we document everything, and you can you can put tags. So um, you can put tags on it. So. You know, if we do expose the utility, we'll measure it, document it with a picture, tag it, utility uh, damage. And so then uh, if there is a dispute on typically it's improper uh, line markings, uh, we certainly have that documentation and we can search by uh, tag. So we search by the tag, we, we search utility damage or whatever, it pulls it right up. Uh, I agree. I, I think it's worth checking it out. Uh, they have a they have like a free introductory period. You should probably check that out. Um, I We love it. Absolutely love it as a company. Zachary says, that's what we do. A weekly check that gets material prices for each quote. Uh, vendors do take two or three days, and customers aren't very understanding. Very frustrating. Hopefully this ends soon. I agree. I absolutely agree, Zachary, is that you know the the, the time it takes to, to get this pricing is nuts. But the reason is everyone has to reprice things every week or every five days to make sure they get the current pricing. So a lot of this time is just repricing. Um, we should try to take the uh, lead time out of that. No, it's it's not that it wasn't a fair question, Zach. So you know, it comes up a lot. It, this is a worthy conversation. We need to talk about it. But 
you know, there's something, and there's some things like pricing discussion gets a little bit weird in a public forum anyway. Um, you know, it, it was an okay question and it's not that it wasn't fair. Uh, I need a number to show the restoration is a fraction of replacement, even when they think I'm expensive. So I think what you could do, just expanding on the conversation that Caleb and I had, I think what you could do is, is ask a fence contractor that you work with a lot to say, hey, ballpark it for me. You know, a, a couple hundred foot, two gates. What's it cost to yank that thing out and put it in? I'm not holding your feet to the fire. Feel free to give me a range. But what do you think that costs today? Um, I mean, because really that's what you're wanting to give the client anyway. You're not going to tell them what it's going to take to replace their fence. You're just saying it, on average, it costs X dollars per foot. I like the way you're thinking because you're giving them the value proposition, right? You're telling them, you know, it could be 30 to $50 to replace this thing, or it could be X for me to restore it. And you can get a little bit more life out of this. You can prolong this a little bit. Uh, I like where your head's at. I really do. Guys, we are right at the two hour and 30 minute mark. Um, I think we're probably going to call this a day. We had a great conversation with Caleb, one that I expected only last a half hour and lasted two and a half hours. So incredibly thankful to him. Guys, if you're thinking about staying at all, Stay Still Experts sponsors my lives. I thank them for that. But I we use them as a company. We've used them as a company longer than they've been a sponsor. Uh, and if you if you talk to Caleb for any length of time, you absolutely understand he's legitimately a really good person. His family are really good people. I enjoy hanging out with them a lot. If you're looking at staying, at least consider them. I like I said, we use them as a company and I like them a lot. With all that being said, guys, I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert, and I'm reminding you. The good fences make good neighbors, and I'll see you next week.